call this meeting the James City County Board of Supervisors to order on October 26, 21 um, at, let me find it, 102. Mr. Stevens, you call the roll, please, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Ms. Sadler? Here. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. Mr. McLennan? Here. Mr. Hipple? Here. All present. And request a motion to amend the agenda to move the board considerations item num number one to board discussions immediately following the presentation by the Commissioner of Revenue. Also request to add an update on the school resource officers under board discussions as well. And so moved. So move. Ms. Stevens, you call the roll, please, sir. Sir, Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right, next on the presentation, um, we've got some great presentations today. And Rebecca Venry, if you come forward, and this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ruin your. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Good afternoon. I'm very, very pleased to be here today to honor and recognize Ms. Rosemary Randall. Um, Ms. Rosemary Randall has been with the county for 49 years. <laughs> she started back in 1972 as a clerk typist in the social services um, division, and she is retiring as the administrative services manager. So as she would say, she's held just about every position <laughs> in accounting and budget within social services. Um, Ms. Randall has been long admired by her peers, her colleagues, her staff. We have several staff here um, wanting to be here for this special occasion. I just, um, I really don't know, have the words to say how much Rosemary means to the county, how much she has invested in the county, um, and if it wasn't for her, social services would not be where it is today. We would not have been able to do all the work that we do without her there making sure that we're following all our policies and procedures and we have all the funding to do it. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Rosemary. She has a few words she wants to say. So. After 49 years, take as long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> it is an honor to stand before you and I appreciate this opportunity. I have enjoyed working for James City County all these many years and I thank the board for paying my taxes in King William County. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a short poem I'm going to read, uh, and it says it all about how I feel about James City County and my work life. Far and away back when I started in July 1972, I didn't know any of you. Rhoda Moyer was the office manager who hired me. I was straight out of high school. It was a blessing, you see. Ten or so social services employees packed like sardines in the Toano EOC until two trailers were placed out back near an old oak tree. The local food stamp program at the time was only two years old. Stamps were distributed at churches and banks, let the truth be told. Then in 1973, after I was hired, Meals on Wheels was incorporated. Of course, healthy food inspired. Our location moved from Toano to Strawberry Plains Road. Fred Sherberger, director, hopped around like a big old toad. <laughs> a successor to James City Transit and Winsburg Area Transport the Winsburg Area Transit Authority in 1977 was upgraded of sort. This was very, very helpful. Routes were expanded. It was good for our citizens because transportation was demanded. In 1979, the department budget was only 763-174. A far cry from today, it is now triple, quadruple, double more. In that same year, there were 500 food stamp cases, another far cry from today. Now we see more faces. Stuart Taylor, Perry DePew, and Jack Edwards, to name a few, were also board members back then, long before you. Social services resided on Strawberry Plains for a short time until consolidation of services echoed by all in a hearty rhyme. Tony Conyers stood by awaiting the Human Services Center. The official opening day was December 1985 in the dead of winter. 
When we moved to Old Town Road facility, the Virginia Department of Health moved too. It didn't bother me. Over time, they turned over some of their equipment to Waymac. Once VDH left, they didn't want the equipment back. <laughs> the next thing I knew, Parks and Rec Administration was leaving. It was better for them. It was just left us a little grieving. The community services combination lasted only a few years. When all other occupants left us, we had to shift gears. A special shout out for all administrative support through the years. They are the backbone. They dispel our fears. They are the best at what they do. Thanks again from me to you. I have worked with some great people. I can't name them all. If I did, I would be standing here until the end of fall. I give thanks to God first, then my family, who encouraged me and continually supported me. Thanks for allowing me to stand here today. For those I leave behind, I double dare you to stay. What do you say when you leave after 49 years? You say, I enjoyed work life and I shed no tears. Thank you all. Thank you. Pictures. Rosemary, here is your certificate of service. Okay. And, uh, you come up here with us? Yes, I will. Do you want to <laughs> Did you want to keep your mask on here and take it off, or where do you want to go? Told you we had some great presentations. All right, our next one, Grace Boone. Today we're here to honor Carrie Lee, and actually, though from different departments, they're both from the same building. So, <laughs> <laughs> Carrie joined James City County 31 years ago. Uh, he was the first assigned to the courthouse down in the city of Williamsburg. So it's been a long time. He transitioned from there a few years later to the Human Services Building. Um, there, Carrie was the sole custodian, maintained approximately 18,000 square feet. Carrie was an independent self-starter. He knew what needed to be done and did it with attention to detail and was highly respected by his peers and community. Carrie is also a great communicator and team player, always willing to help others. Whenever he identified an issue inside or outside the building, he ensured that it got resolved. His supervisor stated, I've worked with Carrie his entire 31 years, and I can hands down say he was the most dedicated employee I ever had. Carrie Lee is a family man. His core values are dependability, concern for others, and commitment resulted in many acts of kindness. One of his acts of kindness was to walk the social services staff out of the facility at night and make sure that they got to their vehicles safely. At the recent retirement party for Carrie, many folks echoed their thankfulness and kindness and that they would miss those daily walks and talk, talk moments. Um, in recent years, as the community spread of COVID-19 has intensified, it created a stark need for cleaning, sanitizing, and monitoring people in and out of facilities, and Carrie was integral to ensure the social services staff felt safe in their spaces. Social services staff also said that Carrie will be greatly missed, and he is hardworking as he has kept the building safe and beautifully maintained for many years. They can't imagine the facility without him. Congratulations on a wonderful career um, and best wishes for your next phase. It has been our pleasure to know you 
and to work with you. And thank Carrie for your years of service and positive impact for staff and residents. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, Lois Mayor, you are a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for your poem. <laughs> uh, if I had known, I would have, I would have written a poem. Uh, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for uh, just this opportunity to uh, recognize you. I've seen you a lot in my building <laughs> over the years. So, uh, but I just, I, I miss uh, all of y'all. I see one, two, three, four. I don't know who else is in here. And this is standing in the background. For, I've known you for a year. Um, I've worked at least two jobs for, I guess, over 30 years. So I really, it's hard for me to find stuff to do other than work. My grandkids, they keep me busy. A lot of things I uh, put off over the years. I kept saying I, I worked, I couldn't do it, so now uh, I have the opportunity to do it. I miss you. Uh, see, they know I'm a crier, so I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna keep it at that. <laughs> uh, I'll come to see you soon. Thank you. All right, next is a presentation on the Natural and Cultural Assets Plans efforts. Tammy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Over the past several months, staff has been working with its consultant on the initial stages of the Natural and Cultural Assets Plan. This undertaking has been planned for a number of years and will implement an action in the 2035 Comprehensive Plan, an operational initiative within the 2035 Strategic Plan, a funded project in the FY21-22 budget, and an action in the draft 2045 comprehensive plan. Staff's consultant, Mrs. Karen Firehawk, will make a brief presentation to the board on this effort. Staff looks forward to any questions and discussion the board might have following the presentation. Thank you. Okay, can you see the screen? I'm waiting for verbal confirmation. You can see the screen and can yes, you hear me? Yes. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. I'm sorry to be the one who is virtual. Um, although, and it's also a difficult act to follow those uh, touching stories about your very dedicated staff who are retiring. But uh, I've also been told I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to be as brief as possible. And again, apologies for not being there in person, but I had to teach at the University of Virginia this morning, and I did not have time to get there from here. So I'm going to talk just briefly about the project that I have been contracted to work on, the Natural and Cultural Assets Plan for James City County. My name is Karen Firehawk, and I'm the director of the Green Infrastructure Center. So just briefly today, I'm going to talk about the project origin, just a quick reminder. I'm going to give you a sampling of uh, our work, just so you can get to know us a little bit in this brief amount of time. I'm going to describe what are natural and cultural assets that this plan will focus on. 
And then finally, I'm going to talk about how we'll make the map and the schedule. So the impetus for the project uh, goes back into multiple documents from James City County. First of all, it was an operational initiative in the 2035 strategic plan, and specifically an outgrowth of affirmed community priorities established during the recent update of your comp plan. Prioritizing the protection of natural lands and open spaces was actually the most highly ranked and supported objective across all three rounds of community engagement. And this process will create a natural and cultural assets plan for the county. The environmental goal, of course, also in your uh, plan was to continue to improve the high level of environmental quality in James City County and protect rural and sensitive lands and waterways that support the resiliency of our natural systems for the benefit of current and future generations. Strategy for the environment number three specifically said you wanted to protect and preserve environmentally sensitive areas and work to maintain and promote the ecosystem services provided by all natural areas. And finally, action for the environment 3.1, you wanted to maintain and promote biological and habitat diversity, ecosystem services, and habitat connectivity by protecting wildlife and riparian corridors between watersheds, sub-watersheds, catchments, another name for watersheds, and tidal and non-tidal wetlands, and by developing and implementing a green infrastructure plan. So uh, we bid on this project and were selected as the winning uh, consultant for this work. As I said, I direct the Green Infrastructure Center and we help communities evaluate their natural and cultural assets to maximize ecological, economic, and cultural returns. So to be clear, this is our actual mission statement uh, and what you said you wanted to do is right in line with, with what you do every day. And we do this work by building landscape models. So we specialize in taking a lot of complicated data and bringing it together to model the highest value resources on the land. We also teach courses and workshops. So we have a rich array of presentation materials, graphics, and books that are available for our folks. Then we also conduct research into new methods. So we are very much a cutting edge organization. We are one of the national leaders in this type of work. And then we also help communities create strategies on the ground, which is what we'll be doing with James City County. Some examples of our work in rural Virginia landscapes uh, there are many more than this, but I didn't want to crowd out the presentation. Um, so, for example, in Albemarle County, connecting and conserving intact landscapes for biodiversity, clean water, and cultural landscapes, very important. Uh, similar to James City County, Albemarle County very much values its, its natural and cultural heritage. Uh, and they also use the information that we provided to inform their purchase of development rights programs. Accomack County was one of our very early projects, conserving natural landscapes in the face of rising seas and protecting the fisheries of the Chesapeake Bay. So taking good care of the land so that we can have high quality fisheries and support the largest clam aquaculture operation on the Eastern seaboard. New Kent County, Virginia, a little bit closer to y'all, working on planning to conserve natural landscapes to support our natural resource network. Suffolk, Virginia, Another uh, nearby neighbor, protecting scenic heritage and working landscapes in a growing coastal community with a lot of competing the economy and the culture. And then Grayson County, Virginia, I just picked that one out because they are super rural uh, and they wanted to conserve their working landscapes especially. So we looked a lot at farming, at forestry and all of those other land-based resources that are really important to protect so that we can continue the economy. And a fun little fact, they're the largest source of sets. And why do we need to evaluate them? Well, the way that we describe this is just as you know the value of your built assets, let's say um, your school buildings or a wastewater treatment plants, um, you know what those are worth, you know how to take care of them, you know when they need to be updated or upgraded. New assets? And then sometimes we might need to take action to either conserve them or restore them. So we call these landscape elements natural assets to help local governments understand that these should be in your asset portfolio. And just like you wouldn't sell a stock without knowing its value, you wouldn't want to make decisions about a landscape without being fully informed of its condition. 
So in this work, we will be helping you to map those assets. And they are uh, anything that you could think of that's on the landscape that would naturally be there. So your forests, your wetlands, and these natural assets also support cultural assets. So for example, you know, I've put a historic house from James City County on the, on the top left of the slide, but try to imagine that structure if it had no trees or it. Um, and then also uh, cultural and recreational assets such as uh, fishing lakes or um, horseback trails that you would take a ride on. That landscape supports those uses, uh, historic markers and where they're found. So we will also be looking at all of those different cultural and historic assets and thinking about how the landscape protects or supports them. There's a lot of benefits to doing this work. So um, I'll just highlight a few of them. Preserving biodiversity and wildlife habitat. So even in a growing and developing community, such as James City County, we still actually have quite a lot of high value uh, resources. And so just understanding how to protect them so they can protect the wildlife that many of us value. Conserving working land, such as farms and forests that contribute to the economy. So we'll be doing some themed overlay maps that look at forestry in James City County, that look at farming. So we'll be including all of those uses. Protecting and preserving water quality and supply, whether that's protecting uh, land that supports a, a surface water support source or whether it's ensuring that groundwater is well recharged. Uh, providing cost-effective stormwater management and hazard mitigation. Resiliency is a word you hear a lot these days. So by protecting your natural resources, your assets are also making the county more resilient. And then improving public health, quality of life, and recreation networks. So uh, making this landscape available so we can continue to enjoy it. So the process that we go through, and this is very abbreviated, so I apologize. But we'll be looking at the habitat cores, those chunks of intact habitat that you have. We'll be classifying the landscape. Is this suburban? Is it urban? Is it wild? We'll be looking at other predictors for uh, what makes for a healthy landscape. And we'll be looking at how well connected your landscape is. So we'll be looking at corridors uh, that might pro provide connectivity for movement. And then we'll be doing themed overlay maps for looking at a deeper dive, looking at water resources, recreation, and agriculture. And then looking at risk and opportunities. So some resources will continue on regardless because they're already in a conservation easement or perhaps they're part of a park, while others might be at risk. And so we will have a conversation about what, if any, action should be taken to conserve some of those. And then we'll, from that, we'll develop strategies. And when I say we, I very much mean uh, not myself, but you all in the room, the Board of Supervisors, the folks that work for you, and the citizenry of Jameson County. So, Will, this will be a very inclusive process. And when I'm talking about habitat cores, I need to stop and provide a little definition because that's not a term everyone bandies about. But what these are, are a way, a shorthand for referring to what's called interior habitat. And that's that landscape that uh, is well protected. And if it's large enough, it can support native species that we would expect to see in Virginia's coastal plain. So for example, uh, certain species, such as the cerulean warbler up in the right-hand side of the screen, uh, that little bird needs about 100 acres of undisturbed forest habitat to survive and thrive. So uh, we're looking at where are those largest chunks of uh, intact habitat that are relatively undisturbed. So we look for about 100 acres. We subtract some area around the edge where disturbance can occur, and we just see, do we still have 100 acres in the middle that's relatively protected? And then we look at the corridors that connect these areas. So 100 meters is sort of a, a, a safe space in the middle. We look for to see, do we have enough room for wildlife to move across the landscape? And who can use these corridors? Well, of course, bears and uh, birds can use these corridors. Pollinators, bees actually make quite a, a lot of use of corridors and cores. Uh, but we can also use these corridors. So sometimes if you are looking to plan a future greenway trail or other trail networks, by having these corridors in place, it might provide other opportunities for recreation, whether it's on private land or uh, whether it's something that you're going to create as a public asset. So we go through a six-step process, setting your goals, what do you value? And to be clear, we will be using goals that you've already established as part of your comprehensive planning process. You spend a lot of time thinking about visions and goals. So we'll be mining those to pull forward uh, those ideas that we can then support with this plan. 
We'll be looking at all the different data sources. So we've already collected and analyzed a lot of data, but there's all different kinds of data that are available, both uh, say scientific data or data about a new road that you would be planning, but also data from the community. Like somebody knows that this particular landscape is special or important. Then we'll be creating maps. So we'll be creating a base network map to show how all this links together. And then we'll be doing some of those themed overlay maps like I spoke of, agriculture, recreation, et cetera. We'll be looking at the risks. So we'll be thinking, is there any action we need to take? And then we'll be thinking about what's the most important thing to do because we can't do everything. So we need to prioritize and strategize. And then finally, implementation. And that's uh, at the point at which I will leave you to do the implementation. But we'll work very hard to come up with ideas that are implementable. And we'll also be bringing ideas from other communities around Virginia and giving you sort of fresh looks at, uh, at your community as well as things you might not have thought of doing. And then I'm also pretty good at uh, coming up with potential grant sources if funding is needed. So we can also advise you on that. So here's the process in brief. Um, and we just, we just are at the very beginning uh, phase. So of course we've uh, created a, a work plan and we've oriented some of your staff on the process. Uh, we've been in the process of obtaining data and creating relevant information that we'll be using throughout the process. And now we're in this process uh, from September through November of creating that base network map. We've already got one draft of it. We're working with your staff to make sure it's up to date. And then we'll be looking forward to bringing that information to the committee that you'll be appointing later today. So the technical advisory committee is made up of county staff and they'll be making sure that we have our facts straight and are aware of all relevant future and current county planning initiatives. The steering committee that you'll be appointing today um, will be an advisory group to us. They're not the deciders, you're still the deciders, but they will be bringing a wealth of local information from each of your districts as well as um, unique and fresh perspectives. So we'll be taking that information in to inform priorities. And then we'll also be having community workshops. So we'll have one or two of those to allow the community to weigh in on the project as well throughout the process. And then we have a board of supervisors check in with you in January and to show you the base network and see if we're on the right track. And then of course, we will check in with you again as we work to complete the strategies. At the final stage will be next July when we will wrap up the project and theoretically you would be adopting the strategic plan into your work. So we've begun the mapping and we're ready to share a base map with the county. So all of those colors that you see on the map at left, those are all areas that have already been flagged as very high value. But we wanna make sure that this map is accurate we want to add in local priorities. And uh, as we rank and evaluate some of these areas, sometimes we give them more points. If say there's an important heritage resource that's also on the landscape, we might rank areas higher. So we're very excited to learn uh, after today who you do decide to appoint. I understand you have a great pool of applicants. And with that, I conclude my presentation and I'm certainly available to take questions. Uh, these are the emails of some of the folks we're working on the project from our office here in Scottsville. So with that, I'll end and see if there are any questions that I can uh, answer. Thank you, Karen. Any questions for Karen? Um, I just have one if I could. Um, I appreciate your presentation very much and it sounds like a very exciting uh, prospect that uh, we're going through here. I wondered uh, whether you've had much experience in the various uh, localities that you worked in in terms of recreating um, the, these kinds of assets uh, with reforestation being a big issue right now and things like that. Uh, um, is that something you've seen uh, happening? Uh, yes, very much so. So uh, if, for example, in Accomack County, when we first did the work, we were looking at the a lot of the natural resources went on both sides of that peninsula. And then we wanted to make sure that the landscape was well connected. And there were some areas that um, there was an obvious corridor there and there were other areas that we decided were restoration corridors. So in other words, if they just planted and filled in some of the vegetation, they could actually recreate that corridor and create a more connected landscape. Um, so we will be looking for those opportunities where areas could be restored as well as what's existing. 
Uh, similarly, in a project for Norfolk, Virginia, uh, I didn't show you that, that was an urban plan, uh, but we made both a map of their existing assets and then a future map of all of the links, the new connections that the city's going to be working on making. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I have a few. Um, will we be working with property owners larger than like 20 acres? The larger, you know, a lot of times we, we do certain things and we don't consider the actual owner of the property. And that to me is a very important issue that we reach out to those owners and, and get them involved as well. And a lot of them probably won't know what's going on and, and that sort of thing. But is there a way we can reach out to those owners and say, we're looking at this and how it affects them and you know whether it adds value or doesn't add value depends on who you talk to and and who the owner is so you know it might be an educational thing as well for some of the owners that have the larger pieces in james city county absolutely so when i <clears throat> when i sit down to uh, look at you know what the strategies might be seeming to uh, uh, to be uh, sometimes we'll say wow this would make a really great corridor across this property would that property owner be interested in, say, pledging to maintain that into the future? Uh, you, you have other areas of the county, such as ag forestal districts, where uh, those landowners have already pledged to maintain that area for the next five to 10 years. So uh, those are the type of landscapes that will, are likely to remain in place. Uh, but yes, identifying uh, large landholders and doing that outreach to them to see that uh, they're aware of the project and that they're on board is very important. Um, but I, I, I've, I've got a lot of experience of uh, working with landowners in, in rural areas. So looking forward to it. Great. And the um, another thing would be the um, trash. And I know it sounds silly, but, you know, every community deals with their trash issues and that sort of thing. And um, how much that affects our environment and how much trash we're throwing out on the roads. And, and we we're, we're work very hard in James City County to keep it as clean as possible. And we're putting more things into place, but, you know, that may be something to look at as well. How, how does trash affect these efforts of trying to keep clean waterways and that sort of thing, and maybe a, an educational thing as far as how we could, you know, cut down on trash in order to keep our waterways clean? Yeah, so that idea is an example of something that we, we can take up in the process as we look at opportunities, because, you know, if you have a historic corridor, and for example, residents or tourists who are traveling through there want to see a beautiful James City County. And if it's it's marred by trash or there's dumping problems, that's definitely something that would be part of this project. So, uh, yeah, we're we're really open at this point to hearing all of your concerns. Uh, I don't know that you have the time to give them all to me in this meeting, no. but uh, <laughs> we definitely want to know about them. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, Karen, thank you very much for spending time with us today and letting us know where we're heading. All right. Thank you so much. Thank and you. looking forward to who I get to work with. Sounds good. Thank you very much. All right. Bye for now. Bye. -bye. All right. Next, we'll go into our consent calendar. And I'm not going to read every one of them, but our consent calendar consists of nine items. Are there any items on the consent calendar that any member wishes to remove? I don't necessarily. Number two, okay. All right. John in the room. There he is. And, and while he's coming up, this to you, when we amended the thing, we, we didn't move. We just relocated some things in the agenda. We didn't move anything out of the consent agenda. Right. We okay. just I, I, adjust. I, I, I wasn't sure about. Yep. Whether that was. Yes, ma'am. The only question I had, I, I never seen anything before. It seems only that I'm a little skeptical that the and so I I just wondered if, if you really think that you know like overall if, if you need to be looking at you know Well, yeah, I, th I think yeah, there are two issues. The rate of pay, I think, is in in several positions that we've looked at. You know, we've got, uh, we had 10 or 11 full-time vacancies, and I think we're down to seven or eight now. 
And when we've looked at those positions and benchmarked them against others, you know, we're, we're finding that we are a little below the market rate now. So I do think that's one issue, but for this specific position, this is a holdover. This employee that had been in this position had been about 20 years, and, and it was a 30-hour with full benefits. And so as we've these things have happened, people have retired or moved on, we, we think that it's, it's more cost-effective in the long run to, especially in these type of positions where we have multiple uh, 10 to 15 part-time positions, hours available to convert them to full-time. Because we find that full-time employees tend to stay longer than the part-time, and this was our first opportunity in the fitness area to do that. It will be it will be interesting to see what we end up paying. That is the starting pay, and we have a little wiggle room there, and in, in that it could be $13 an hour, but, you know, we'll see when we get it out there and we get it advertised. But, yes, I do think it, it's going to be challenging. Any of our frontline positions are, are hard to fill right now, and aside from the full-times, we probably have another 20 to 25 part-time positions that we're having a challenge filling, but it's not just here. I attended a meeting this morning in Harrisonburg with directors from around the state, and it's 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 statewide. So just like bus drivers and others, you know, it's a challenge right now. So I think we'll deal with that, but I do think it's important that we try this and see if we can if we can fill it. And, and Ms. Larson, if I, if I could follow up, we are doing a pay study relative to the minimum wage increase. It's going to push to $15 an hour in a few years to see what impact that has, but as uh, Mr. Carnifax alluded to, when you raise one, it impacts six other positions. And so they are concerns throughout many of our departments with rates of pay and the ability to attract qualified employees. So um, I'm with uh, Mr. Carnifax believing we can get somebody in this position, but it continues to be a challenge to recruit staffing. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate you. it. Chairman, if there are no others to be uh, discussed, I'll move the adoption of the consent calendar. Thank you. I have a motion on the floor. Roll call, please, sir. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right, next we'll move into board discussions. And our first is Commissioner Revenue, Mr. Richard Bradshaw. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to do this a little differently. I understand that you folks had some questions first. Uh, so, so I'll take questions to begin with and then cover a couple of other subjects that uh, you might not have thought about. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, Any questions? I've got a few. If, yeah. No. No? Okay. The, um, I know we've talked a few times about Airbnb, and that's a difficult thing to, to um, you know, nail down as far as who, what, when, where. Um, I think there's some legislation going on about that. Am I correct Actually, on that? Actually, it's legislation that has taken effect. Okay. Uh, and notably, Airbnb was not included in it. <laughs> okay. All the other electron, uh, uh, internet platforms were, but Airbnb was not. Uh, what is going to happen is for those like Expedia, and some of the others, they will be reporting uh, the, tax, the local taxes, collecting and, and reporting local taxes. The only problem we're going to have is they're not currently required to tell us who they're paying for. Commissioners Association is working on that. Okay. But that actually began for uh, sales as of September 1st. Okay. All right, appreciate that. Um, also, um, I know I was, you and I both talked about Wawa and when we made that decision and, and where we thought our revenue was going to be is not where our revenue is. In fact, there's no revenue right now. And there, we will only be, own... there will be no revenue for us from that, from that business. Okay, because uh, I know the is, board. It is physically located in York County. Uh, the, where the Exxon station was, we had a, we have a, a corner, and uh, it was about an equal size part of the York County lot that was used for the for the Exxon station. And in fact, if you took an aerial photograph and looked at that on the map, you would see that the county line pretty much cut that site right in half. 
went right through the middle of the building. So it was a 50-50 split. Now, almost everything is in York County. Yeah, what, 12%? 12% uh, of the surface area. <clears throat> if you want to look at business assets, we have one gas pump. That business is a York County business. Unfortunately for us, because I would love to have business license and, and personal property off of it, but it is, it is located in York County and it is going to be their revenue. And I, I, it's, it, it's a shame and maybe that's something the board looks at as future decisions. You know, if I'd have known that them, that they move in that building back a little bit, cut us out because our traffic is terrible on that corner. If I'd have known that, that building would have never gotten my vote for that because. Well, I'll, I'll be honest, Mr. Triple, I would commend you on uh, the site plan that you did approve because it's a 100% improvement over what was there with the Exxon station. Oh, it is. It is, but we lost a lot but of we revenue. Lost, we lost We lost revenue. Uh-huh. And we, we gained more traffic and we lost more revenue, which is not a position I like to be in at all. I don't blame you. <laughs> um, I was under the impression at that location originally that we were going to get a small percentage just because of the small piece that, that we own up front. And I, I had heard it kind of compared to a lot of other businesses along that corridor where we have the same situation. Um, so are. I was under the impression that we were going to be receiving a, maybe a little bit, but something out of that. Uh, there are actually, including the Exxon station, there were three businesses in the county and York County that we split. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two are actually down here at McClaw's Circle. Uh, a small convenience store in the, uh, what they call their uh, marketplace, and the Thai restaurant. Everything else is either in one locate, one jurisdiction or the other. I think the, that, to Mr. Hipple's point, is that it behooves us as a board when we are considering these things and questions like that arise, and we feel that that is a pertinent factor in how we make our decision, that we need to be a, a little bit better about how we memorialize that in uh, an enforceable uh, agreement. So, you know, I think the lesson learned from this was, because I agree with you, I, my understanding was that, yeah, yeah, it was gonna, we were going to get one gas pump, but that, the, uh, that, the, that we were going to get at least some of the revenue out of it. And uh, so that, that was... I agree. Had, had I known this situation then, not what we were told, I would probably not have supported it. I've got two quick things. Uh, one is a follow-up on that in a sense. Um, uh, we have talked in the past about uh, the issue of um, uh, sales tax revenue uh, uh, that uh, is um, produced for online. Uh, um, being misapplied to other localities uh, by using zip code. Uh, are we in pretty good shape as far as reconciling those differences? There is absolutely point? no way we can know uh -huh. because the information is not provided to us by, by the folks like Amazon. Uh, they self-allocate, and I think we can all be – all rest assured that the city of Williamsburg is getting substantially more than what they technically should, and we are getting substantially less because the shared zip codes primarily say Williamsburg, Virginia. I, I thought they were able to do addresses, though, and, and work that out, and the two were able to, I thought there was some reciprocality yeah, going now, for a business that is located here, yes, but for online sales, that's allocated by somebody in New Jersey. 
And well, that's a problem then. What, that what is are the, a problem. What is, what is your is, organization? There is, no, there is no solution other than sending an auditor to Amazon's headquarters and going through every transaction. Well, one solution would be changing of the zip code, um, which it right. would seem that the, the I mean, you're part of a larger, like we're part of VACO, you're part of a, a organization, a, a group, right? Commissioners of Revenue, you have a, mm -hmm. I mean, is that something that you all might have tackled? We have, we have absolutely no uh, connection with the, with the Postal Service. Right, but I mean, wouldn't that be something that your that your organization might be able to advocate to for? advocate for we, and talk we about? Constantly, we constantly do, and that's why we are we're pushing for. You know, earlier we were talking about the Airbnb. It's the same issue, but it's a little bit easier to to uh, accomplish because uh, a, a correction on that because. We can ask them, which locations are you collecting from? And it's not going to be the same number of transactions. It's going to be you know, 20 physical locations. We can allocate that fairly quickly. But when you have multiple sales, multiple uh, locations, I wouldn't be surprised if I ordered something with my physical address as being 101 Peninsula Street, Williamsburg, that it would get allocated by some of the online places as being in the city of Williamsburg. So this is a, an issue that... Uh, it's, an, it's a big issue. It right, has been an right. issue for... To my knowledge, at least 30 years, and it goes, and, and that was even back with with a lot of the brick and mortar places, and we still have that. Right. Well, and of course, we weren't able to collect the sales tax on on internet sales for a, a very long time. That's correct. So that's a, a very recent development, and presumably something that we we need to be thinking about our state organizations or our na even national organizations addressing, because this is not just an issue in Virginia, presumably. Um, but let me let me just uh, follow up on another uh, issue, and that's the Airbnb question. Um, do we have a sense of how many um, Airbnb facilities um, are actually um, meeting any kind of requirements for uh, licensing or reporting? To, uh, well, they, again, they are not licensed as Airbnb. They're licensed as yes. hotel motel. Correct. Um, right. I can get back with you and let you give you some idea of how many we have licensed. But the bigger issue there is your zoning requirements. I can't issue a license to them unless they've got the proper zoning. Right. And our current statutes require a special use permit in most cases. So there's no way that I can come up with all of them. I can't issue licenses to them. Um, and the other part is we also have the factor of people who have timeshares. They don't want to use them this, this, this year, so they rent them out and use an Airbnb-type platform. There's absolutely no way you're going to find that unless you go in and make the reservation for that particular one and find out that you can contact the owner and find out who it is. Uh -huh. uh, there's... It's a so it's a challenge and and, and it's uh, a challenge. I, I had a follow up on that. So if someone comes in and they are looking to get a business license and they're not zoned correctly, um, but most likely probably walking out of here and continuing to operate an Airbnb, is that information that you are able to pass to county staff with an address? Is that do you have a, a relationship like that that you can tell us? Hey, there's a there, there's somebody so came in, they're of, not zoned part correctly. Of, part of the process is you get the application. You also have to complete a home occupation registration form. That is sent over to zoning. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
Um, also wondered if you might be able to tell us what's uh, how the um, uh, implementation of uh, to, of the uh, cigarette tax. Ah, cigarette tax. That was one of the things I had oh, on my okay. list as well. Okay. So far, we have collected one hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars in cigarette tax, and it's been in operation since September one. Uh, September. Mm -hmm. First sale was act to a to a wholesaler was actually uh, August the. 14th, uh, but uh, we have been selling those at a, at a pretty good clip. Uh, we are going to have to go through within the next month or so and get a different type of stamp to put on what would be carryover inventories. Uh, wholesalers will not pick up those in, uh, and swap out the existing inventories. So what we'll have to do is, is get a, for lack of a better term, a press and stick, a peel and stick stamp, to put on those, and go to and and take care of any carryovers at that point. So am I right in, in suggesting that uh, in, in the first two months of operation we've collected one hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars? We have, I have deposited one hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars as of today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, Fairly significant and that's, source that's, of revenue. and we're we're looking at almost exactly two months of sales. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that I have that I think you need to be aware of deals with personal property values. As you have read in the papers, seen on TV, motor vehicle values have gone through the roof. Since January, motor vehicle values have gone up, upwards of 35 to 40 percent. If my own Ford Focus were valued today for personal property tax rather than back at January 1st, January 1st it would have had a, it has a uh, had a value of. $9,150. As of today, and I just looked it up on the internet, it would be valued at $13,500. This is a tremendous increase, and it's also one that is just, just as quickly as it go, went up, once the supply shortages are, are taken care of, it will come down just as fast and just as hard. So you need to be aware that there is some volatility there. Uh, next year's personal property and uh, tax for the calendar year uh, probably be a little distorted from what it really should be. Other questions? I know I'm I'm probably beating a dead horse, but the Wawa, is there any way <laughs> <laughs> we can get that 12%? Because, I mean, I'd imagine that company is making a pretty good nickel on that corner. I watch it every day. It's pretty busy. And it's swamped all the time. And 12%, even if 12% out of a million, 120,000. If we were to do that, we would have to also go back and do every other business that is partially in one and partially in the other, and it would go both ways. You can't do one without doing all. But it sounds like there's only, what you were saying, is only a couple other businesses? There, well, there's only two up, and, and those are, believe it or not, they are split 50-50 because that's where the line is. Right. The Thai restaurant over on uh, McClaw's Circle, that line goes straight through the middle of that that restaurant, the convenience store and marketplace, the line goes straight through the middle of that store. And, and, and the Exxon station, the line went straight through yep. the middle of it. And that, and but those other two are already doing 50 to us and 50 They're already county. doing 50 50. So then the only one we'd need to worry about would be Wawa. No. <laughs> okay. There are others that are, again, I, I, would have to look to find right. out which ones are split, which ones we're getting that are uh, partially in York County, 
but there are those, and there are others that are partially in York County, or, or partially in ours that, that York County is getting. Uh, and that has been the way of, again, where it was predominantly located uh, is, has been the, been the general rule that we've followed with York. Uh, okay. So, All right. So we don't have to worry about which side of the restaurant we sit on, though, right? Excuse me? <laughs> we don't have to worry about which side of the restaurant we sit on. Uh, no. <laughs> Great. Okay, good. Uh, and you don't have to have to worry about where the inventory in the little convenience store is either. <laughs> Once it gets to the register, it's half and half. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, which pump is ours? Because I'll get it out. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Far left corner. Far left corner. Got it. Note to self. Closer to Hardy's. <laughs> That's right. It's the. It's the, again. It's the. The uh, entrance off of Route 60 is actually in James City County. Right. And that one pump right there on the, on the very corner is, is in James City phys physically. Hate to lose anything. <laughs> <laughs> All you right, any other questions? Richard, thank you for spending right, some sir. time with us and coming by. You folks take care and thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, next we'll go into the fiscal year 2021 school year end spending plan. Ms. Day. Welcome. Good afternoon, Good Chairman, afternoon. members of the board. At a meeting on September 21st, 2021, the Williamsburg James City County School Board adopted a spending plan for the fiscal year 2021 year end funds totaling about $8.9 million. These funds represent underspending and revenues received in excess of the original budget for the fiscal year that ended this past June 30th, 2021. The county's share of the total local funding for the fiscal year 2021 budget was about 90.4%, and the result of that was about $8.1 million that would be returned to the county. The spending plan that was adopted by the school board included the following projects. School bus replacements, transit fleet expansion, Clara Bird Baker dehumidification solution, classroom instruction upgrade, competitive bus driver salaries, and a capital improvement plan set-asides. Attached is additional documentation provided by the school division regarding their specific request, and the attached resolution, if adopted, approves the school board's requested spending plan and appropriates the funding in the county's budget to be used for those intended purposes. That concludes my remarks. I did want to mention that the school superintendent, Dr. Heron, is here with us today to respond to any specific questions that you may have. Any questions at this point? Do you have a further presentation? I do not. The schools are not making a presentation. Nothing formal. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask a question then about uh, about the school bus replacement? Uh, and it's not really a question about th this allocation for, for this year, but rather a more general question about the plan that's laid out for the replacement over a 15 or 16 year uh, period. And that is, um, uh, my expectation is that uh, as, as the next several years um, progress, we are going to see more movement toward uh, the um, uh, replacement of uh, uh, diesel fuel buses uh, with uh, electric uh, buses, which at this stage are, are more expensive, uh, though their maintenance costs are a lot lower. Um, is that something that, uh, that is being factored into consideration here? I'll defer to the school division to answer your specific question. Welcome, Dr. Heron. Good afternoon, Chair Hipple, board members, Mr. Stevens. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present the plan uh, this afternoon. As you know, per contract, we ask for approval to, to use some of the funds. With regard to buses, um, we are actually currently, we've got four electric buses on the road, and mm -hmm. we're not uh, seeking to buy any more until we really look at their efficiency and the savings from those, because at the moment they cost about twice the price of the regular bus. As you know, we got those four through a grant fund paying the difference between a regular diesel bus and another bus. Um, I think as 
prices come down, we certainly will, will be continue to look at that and look at our efficiencies as well. Did you typically um, go through a grant program? Is it like a matching grant kind of thing? Yeah, our first, um, yeah, it was a matching grant for the first one. We've looked at two others since then, one that we found was not of benefit uh, because all of the money had to be paid up front uh, with no guarantees. We're actually looking at another grant program right now. We certainly don't want to get into a situation where we're, the grant uh, requires us to buy a certain type of electric bus because we wouldn't want several different versions within the fleet. So we're looking at all options that come our way if there are grant programs available. Thank you. So if you get the buses, do you, are you gonna have drivers that are, and, and how is your on time improved with your, I'm so sorry it's so dark in here. I just, um, yeah, our, our on time has improved significantly. If you notice in the plan, there is a request for an increase uh, transfer of money to increase driver pay. Yep. Having looked at our driver pay in the region, we're actually below other uh, school divisions in the region. We are about 20 drivers short at the beginning of the year. <clears throat> we currently have nine openings uh, because we have some of those already filled, four with the CDL and seven still in training to get their CDL. Uh, we are, that's something Mrs. Larson will have to continue to work on constantly throughout the year. But there is one other thing in the plan asking for many buses, which is beginning to diversify our fleet because uh, drivers can drive many buses without a CDL. And those drivers are easier to hire than the regular yellow bus driver. I remember years ago, a certain school board member thought that that should be done in but here's there's nothing you can do. You can't go backwards. So, you know, you can only go forwards. Because I do think that that's a good idea, especially for the trips between the schools. It's more economical. I understand. I think the reasoning given back in the day was that you needed the bus for field trips and that kind of thing. So it just made more economic sense to buy buses. But I see a lot of buses that go between the schools where you have one person on them. And you, this may not solve all that. I understand you have to have the the people and et cetera to move it. But um, but I, I was curious if you, um, how your issues were going since the beginning of school, because I know that that was a little bit of an issue there. Yeah. And um, then I just had one other question. It doesn't fall under this, but since your school board has not taken the opportunity to go to the General Assembly and ask to have taxing authority, um, and they, they are put in the position of having to come here to ask us for the additional funds at the end of the year, um, I am going to ask an operational question, and that is I've seen where a lot of school systems have gone to like a week um, giving some additional time off just because of the simple burnout, um, and I've talked to a few teachers, and they are very, it's been a very, very stressful year, um, and didn't know if that was anything that, how what you all were doing to try to address the burnout issue, because for us, it is an issue because the better our school system is, um, the better that is for us in an, from an economic development um, standpoint. Plus, for our citizens, um, we want to make sure that we're providing um, very good schools. And so, um, but I understand it's been just a very, very tough last two years. So how is your staff and your teachers, et cetera, coping with that? Mrs. Larson, thank you for the question. We are very concerned about um, our staff morale right now and especially that of teachers because they are not only teaching their own classes, they're covering for teachers who are others who are absent. And so there's quite a heavy burden on our teachers right now. I did send a, a communication to all teachers last Friday and we did several things uh, in trying to relieve that situation. First of all, we put a pause on all professional learning for the year and give the teachers back that time as uh, planning time. Uh, we actually have worked with our sub situation using uh, federal funds. We have put a permanent sub in, the, in every building at the beginning of the year. We've just added a second one using federal funds. We're also working on a plan to have central office staff go out a couple of days a week to relieve the substitute situation as well. So we're really 
coming from every angle to take some pressure off our staff right now. Currently, uh, we do have some virtual days on the calendar. We're looking at the reuse of those. Um, our first goal is to keep students there five days a week. That's our first goal. So by taking everything else off teachers first and keeping our students in the classroom, we're hoping to keep the focus on teaching and learning. Thank you, I appreciate that. Just a quick question, if I may, about the um, the minivans. So are they mini buses or minivans? Because I um, we got an email saying that um, it was the understanding that there were 10 minivans that were needed for transporting special needs students. Yes, we, we've actually asked for 10 minivans in the plan, and those are for low ridership routes that Mrs. Larson mm -hmm. referenced. They will be for out-of-zone students, which are mainly special education students being transported out of their zone to a specialized program. Uh, we will probably use them to transport some of our homeless students because they're coming in, slow, in low numbers as well from a place to a certain school. So we'll be using drivers who don't need a CDL on those buses to diversify our fleet, and there will that will lead to less buses on the road with a small number of students. So they're actual minivans. They are minivans that, that okay. seat that we can seat several students in. Okay, thank you. So is the act still the homeless act that you provide transportation to a student's school regardless of where, if if. They're let's say they're staying in um, temporary housing in a hotel, but it's zoned uh, Claire Bird, but they had been going to DJ Montague. Are you, you still required to transport to DJ Montague? Yes, ma'am. McKinney okay. Vinto requires that we, we transport all homeless students. Thank you. And if I could just ask uh, uh, um, to uh, verify that my understanding is that the capital projects beyond the transportation <coughs> items that you mentioned, the, the buses uh, and vans, uh, we're talking about uh, the um, uh, dehumidification process at, at uh, uh, Clara Bird Baker. There's a, a serious problem, I guess, there with, with uh, air quality. We had a, pres a very significant episode with air quality uh, summer before last, and we're still resolving that. And this system will be set on top of the current HVAC system and, and serve to, to dehumidify the, the building. Um, at some point when that system is replaced, this new piece will go into the new system as well. So it's not something that will lose its value over time. And the other two pieces are, are um, at Lafayette High School and at uh, Jamestown High School, uh, the cafeteria in the case of Jamestown High School. Yes, if you recall uh, last year in our capital improvement plan, we actually looking at the numbers across uh, and our production predictions for enrollment, we took we moved back the additional classroom space for all high schools and moved it out of the five-year plan. Uh, we kept in two projects. One was the cafeteria at Jamestown. We are currently at 102% capacity there, and students are eating outside at tables and hallways in the cafeteria, especially challenging this year with, with trying to separate uh, students out. So that, is, that has been a need for a significant length of time, and it's one we'd like to fulfill for the school, even if we're not adding uh, other space. The Lafayette expansion, or in fact not expansion, it's the renovation of the 900 building, Currently, uh, CDR is using a portion of that building. They're uh, scheduled to move out in, I believe, in June of 22. So we'd like to go ahead and design and renovate that building so that building can be used to full capacity by the students in the building. Yeah, I was going to say, um, coming back to the buses, I, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying to sort of put my, wrap my head around it because I, I see on, on, the, on the little letter that you sent where we um I'm trying to find where i am here on this thing um where it it's uh 1.13 million for school bus replacements but when, we, when we're talking about your smooth your smooth flow would be 10 10 a, a, a year but in fy21 you actually bought 14 is that correct that's correct okay and then uh, what what is your plan for for buying in 22 before, in other words, before you came back to us with this request, what was your plan for what you were going to buy in 22? I'm going to get Ms. Ewing to speak to the actual plan and where we're in that. Ms. Ewing's our chief financial officer. 
Welcome. Thank you. In our fiscal year 22 budget, we had started um, to build in replacements for four buses. Four, okay. Yes, sir. So what you're looking for is to put an additional 10. Yes, sir. We, ha we have utilized some of those funds to start diversifying the fleet. We've purchased two minivans and then a um, mini bus this year with some of those funds. Okay. And we haven't moved forward with the purchase of a school bus yet until we see where the contract goes with the company we had to contract with for transportation services. So you, you haven't bought any of the four you'd planned for? No, sir. Okay. And so would the ultimate plan, if we said yes to what you've requested here, put 14 new buses in the FY22? We could purchase 12 because we've utilized some of those funds already okay. to get some other So, so what you're asking for would, would still limit you to about 12? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. School buses. Um, I'm going to jump in here real quick. The, um, of course, I've always talked about seat belts and, and we're getting there. Um, but the, the, the school bus, I, I know I've talked about ever since I've been on this board. And we've always requested school buses, but it always seems the funds get diverted somewhere. And next year we need more school buses and more school buses. And I said years ago, let's put 10 in every year if that's the number we need and, and, and buy 10. I still can't get beyond the concept of, well, we spent some money for this, but we had it appropriated for school. Bus. And I know once we give you the money, it's up to y'all to spend it any way you can. So I'm not trying to say you have to spend the money this way. I'm just, as a business person, if I appropriate funds for something, I'm going to buy that something. But it doesn't seem to work with the school system, and it gets very frustrating. And... So every year I sit up here and we talk about school buses and, and I support the school and support school buses and what we need. It's <clears> just we're, we're missing our mark for some reason and I, I've yet to understand that. Uh, generally, Mr. Hibble, I'll, I'll respond to that one. Um, this year was an unusual year. Generally, we do spend the money allocated to buses on buses unless it's something of an emergency need. This year, because of the need to diversify our fleet and get other drivers who didn't have a CDL on the road, we did go ahead and buy some smaller buses from that funding. Our main ask for buses comes in the end of year spending every year, and that's very much replacement of our fleet because at the moment we have uh, 21 buses over 15 years. We've 22 over 250,000 miles. And so our replacement cycle is 10 every year, and that's what we come and ask for in this Monday, this money. Um, one possibility to, to standardize that would be to make it part of our capital improvement plan rather than part of an end of year plan request. And that certainly would standardize it. Right, and that way we would know we have this amount we're gonna spend every year, and we see next year 10 new buses and we take those, and I know, you know, and I'm not sold on the electric bus as of yet. Maybe in a few years, maybe, I don't, I don't know. But to pay double for a bus and a diesel engine, 400,000 miles is average for a diesel engine. We've got 250,000, so we've still got life on those. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, we can get bigger bang for our buck with a diesel engine than we can with electric. Maybe years from now, electric price were coming down and that sort of thing. But do they have a, a life expectancy on an electric bus? I would have to ask Mr. Snipes to answer <laughs> that one. Uh, he was I, hoping. I, he was I, hoping. I, he I don't get into the details of the, the bus batteries and things like that, but I do know there is uh, some automatic re replacement of those that come with our current purchases. Right. Um, the life expectancy Welcome. on a good, good afternoon, board members. The life expectancy for a uh, battery for a, a uh, electric bus is ten years. So ten after years. ten years, you're replacing that battery. So. Okay. And we're getting an average on our diesel buses now. Well, the, the recommendation from the state is fifteen years, one hundred and fifty thousand miles, and that's okay. what our plan is based on. Okay. And um, and so the battery replacement. I know this is tough to. What is the cost of that? Because if it's the batteries just going out, we can replace the batteries. Right. But eventually, we're going to have a hard time recycling the batteries. But 
that's another that matter correct. for we another will, time. We will get you that answer. I think I know, but I want to be sure before we answer. But I, we can get you that answer on what the cost okay. of a battery replacement will be. I'd appreciate it. Okay. Thanks for all your hard work. Right. One more quick question. Um, since I would imagine your fleet kind of sat idle for 2020 for a good year, does that give you the opportunity to bump your need out a year? Since you didn't put all those miles on your buses for a good part of a year? I believe some of those buses were still over 150,000 miles last year because mm -hmm. they were so close. So as we started to roll this year, they just went over that 150 mark. Okay, thank you. I just had a quick, uh, yes, quick follow up on the 900 building. Sure. You're ready, so you've got to take it from a daycare or, yeah. The yeah, CDR does have a building to go to and they're scheduled to exit the 900 building in, in 22, in June 22. So if we're ready to to reconstruct or renovate the building, then we'll have more classroom space in, in Lafayette. So that's what I was, that was the question, sorry. I, are you just going to make, do you have a plan for the 900 building or is it just additional classroom space, period? Actually, the design for that is in this year's CIP and that, that process will be starting. So. Okay, all right, thank you. And with that, that that will that alleviate and and here's the bad question that seems to be not wanting to be asked is redistricting which i think we missed it years ago several years ago we redistricted everything but jamestown and that kept that hot and heavy and 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 i know there was a lot of pressure on the board members because i went to those meetings and heard the mothers and fathers that did not want to any redistricting because they wanted their children to go there. But I think we've got the ability, and especially with doing the 900 building, to look at redistricting and alleviate some of the pressures on Jamestown, which our uh, future think is, is basically flat for the next 10 years right. as far as growth and that sort of thing, which, you know, that could change. I mean, anything could come in and change that. But as of what we can see and what we've always gone with, that is that is a, a flat line. So I don't see the growth picking up over there. And I think if we redistrict and worked on the 900 building, that would alleviate that as well. And that would be a huge cost savings for the schools. Yeah, Mr. Hubbard, I think it opens up the possibilities if the space is ready. There's no doubt about that. Okay, that's good. What is your capacity at Lafayette High School right now? Our, our capacity is uh, 1,126, and it is currently at 86%, but that does not include the 900 building. So because without adding that extra space, you're already, you're just at 86%. We're at 86%. That includes the 900 building, mm -hmm. which is currently being used for other programs. So there is room, when that is repurposed, to what it originally was, which is classroom space, there is potential to move up beyond the 86. The actual main building is, is full, but that, that capacity includes the 900 building, which is not usable for classroom space right now, regular okay. classroom space. We have CDR in a portion of the building. We have our GED program. We have a learning lab in the building. So there are some other programs there, but it's not normal classroom space. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Herring. I appreciate your time and effort here. All right. The um, I know that you know several of the items on here. I'll I'll lead off with a little discussion on it. You know the the air quality and all is definitely an issue. I think if there's an issue in any of our schools with an air quality issue, you know we need to address that definitely as quickly as possible. I know the school system has been doing that. It's not anything. Don't want the paper to think. We already have this big issue. The school's done an excellent job taking care of those issues, and but they need the funding in order to address this air quality issue. I think that's an important thing. Um, the 900 building will help alleviate some pressure, and that's where I think over at Lafayette. Um, some of the rest, I'd almost think we ought to roll it into our budgeting process and discuss it more. I'd like to have some more time on it to discuss it with our budget and what's going on with our budget and that sort of thing and, and um, you know, and, and move the important items that 
or that I feel are important, move those. Somebody else may feel others are important, but that I feel important, move those items ahead and, and get that approved and, and going forward. But the other ones we may want to have, I'd like to have more discussion and, and uh, maybe in a, another work session yeah. and just well, discuss that. Mr. Chairman, I think, I think the, only, the other thing that, that I would uh, consider to be, uh, to be an important uh, uh, case to uh, move forward with would be the, the Jamestown High School uh, cafeteria. Um, you know, we, we know that there's a, a heavy enrollment at, at that high school, and frankly, that cafeteria is uh, pretty small. Uh, and uh, uh, it does seem that uh, something that can get uh, a little bit more space there, especially in the circumstances where we don't want to, you know, force people into a very close uh, contact uh, until we get things under, under control uh, to a much greater degree. Um, uh, might be worth uh, the investment uh, now uh, as opposed to, to waiting on that. Mr. Stevens, if I might ask a quick question. Are we required to, sp to spend all of the money that's left over? And if not, do you have any recommendations on what we could do with that? You know, Ms. Sadler, I don't believe there's a requirement for you to spend it. I mean, that's why the school board is back here to get your authorization to reappropriate it for that purpose. I, I would suggest if you don't fund these things that they've requested, I believe the need is real for the school division, that you would at least fence the money and have it so going into next year. That money is available for the school system use um, for the board to consider at that time and, and to put back towards school priorities. So it kind of be held it, it for the following? Be. If that was the board direction, it could be. Yes, that, that was the question I had because we were looking at Right now, uh, the, the uh, design is FY22, which is the current fiscal year. And a lot of these other things are immediate or, you know, fairly, uh, fairly quick. But the two, two of the uh, uh, very large ones, uh, the, the cafeteria construction and the, lot, and the renovation of the 900 building, are both FY23, which is a budget we have not approved yet. It's all, it's, it's out there for planning purposes. And so what I would uh, prefer, I would, I'm not comfortable saying today that, yeah, let's take that money and, and boom, give it right there. I think these are very valid, and, but I think we need to basically build, like, like the, the Chairman Hippel saying, build it into the FY23 CIP, but that money we need to set aside for that purpose so that if we get down to what we want to do, we have the funds available. Um, and it's, it's earmarked, but it's not, quote, committed at this point. It would be committed during the budgeting, budgeting process if we, as we go forward. And I could support that as well. Maybe that'll give the schools a chance to look into some redistricting that might alleviate some of that um, overcrowding at Jamestown by putting them in less crowded Lafayette. They're not going to be able to redistrict from 102% in the cafeteria to get that down. I mean, it's just simply, they, they don't, the numbers just don't work out that way. And... I mean, the, I, if, if the, the will of the board is not to, to fund it, that's fine. But I don't think we, I, I don't want to be up here on false information to say, first of all, they're a long way from being able to redistrict, even if they went back today. And they're, the, they're, the school board has pr said that they are not, this particular board that they have now is not going to redistrict. They've, they've, they've not been willing to go there. Right. Um, they have the need currently at the in Jamestown, um, and even if they were to move one neighborhood, it's it's not going to make the difference at the cafeteria. It just simply isn't. So, um, so you're saying. So what I'm hearing is we're, we don't want to do the cafeteria design, construction, or the renovation of the 900 building because it, if CDR is moving out in June of 22. And they don't have those, then then they're not going to be able to to uh, do that that's, building. That's, that's not what what, I, what my intent was. My intent is that we're looking at uh, in June of 22, in July of 22, when FY 23 starts, that we're going to have a budget that says here's what your CIP is. We've already got the money set in FY 22 for the, I believe it's for the uh, the, the design of the cafeteria. Um, but the, all the rest of it was scheduled for FY23. What it appears to me they're asking us to do is today to commit this leftover resource money to those projects. I'm not saying no, we won't do it. I'm just saying 
we don't we can do it as part of our normal we can set the money aside and do it as part of our normal budgeting process which when FY23 starts and right out right after the end of June of 22 they've got the money to to to, to do the the project if we if we put it in the budget then was was Jamestown cafeteria did, did I understand it was ranked 25th is that kind of at the bottom of the list of the CIP projects out That's there right. the, the policy committee did rank it as 25 uh, to Mr. Eisenhower's point in terms of funding, you do have the Jamestown High School Cafeteria programmed for FY24. So that cafeteria expansion construction is FY24. So the school system's request is to move it a year sooner. The only money you'd be committing this year that wouldn't give you a chance to talk about it again is your design money. So if, if you moved or approved the, the money for the, the cafeteria, that money they could then spend this year is what they're asking instead of being in your budget process next year. And, but they, they've identified that as FY22, I believe, haven't they? And, and which, would be, which would bring it to the current to the, year. To the yes, current sir. year, yes, absolutely. I would keep it in the budget, in the budget process, just like Jim has talked about, and um, kind of move it forward. So do you have a motion? Well, I, I would approve uh, basically everything they've asked for uh, and take the remain except for the uh, FY23, um, and, which is uh, Jamestown Cafeteria Construction, 2.278 million, and, uh, and then to Lafayette Renovation, 900, 2.946 million. Set that money aside for us to uh, uh, discuss and allocate if uh, as we as we might want to if when we do our budgeting in January starting in January for the FY 23 budget so that they would have the design money for the cafeteria now uh, and they'd have everything else that they've asked for Th those two CIP projects would be put into the normal CIP cycle cycle for yeah. this upcoming budget right and the money would be held so that we have it available for those projects if we decide to press ahead with it at that point so they would they would still have the funds to be able to do the air quality absolutely that they need to do now Every, everything everything else the, the buses the, the you know all the, the only two things that I that I would uh, move that we defer if you will for the normal cycle would be the, the two two large CIP items uh, to uh, Consider when we do our budget. Project. So you're talking about keeping it in the regular time frame process that it is now. That's correct. Okay. We start that process in January, I believe. Actually, yeah. you guys are probably even They're before probably that starting, starting now. <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. Roll call. Mr. McLennan. Um, I I will um, I will vote aye because it's clear that the the board is going to. Um, uh, approve that uh, plan. Um, I would prefer to to go ahead with the other two items, but uh, um, uh, in, in uh, a desire to get moving on this and give the schools clear direction, I'll, I'll vote aye. Mr. So, Eisen, I'm, I'm yes. sorry. What is the amount that we're? What are we pulling out exactly? Our share, because the numbers that were provided in the school memo is not a hundred percent funding um, for the cafeteria and for Lafayette construction. If you actually add their 2,278,000 and the 2,946,000, um, that exceeds the amount that's actually being requested. They're requesting about 92% of that. Okay. So that now, number that, is 4.5 million. That's the figure we're, we're looking, that I'm, I'm actually looking for. I'm, I didn't have it in front of me, so. Correct. Roll call. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Sadler? I qualified by saying I think those items that we were setting aside is so that we could look at them and vet them as it comes into the process. So with that, I'm an I. Ms. Larson? I'm a no because I would have approved the entire bit. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. All right, next we'll look at... Um, Next on our agenda is a school resource officer chief. Welcome, sir. Glad to have you. And the, the reason we're discussing this, there was an article, just to give you a little heads up off the board. There's an article in the WI Daily talking about the um, resource officers and how some communities are not having resource officers and how, you know, James City County and York County have resource officers. 
and I, I can't say enough about our resource officers with all the kids I've had in school and, and helping the school work with the school and, and, and becoming a partner with our school system. It's, it's been a, a, a great asset to our community. Chief, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, sir. Good, good afternoon again, board members and Mr. Chairman. I have here our school resource officer from Jamestown High School, and he's also our officer of the year. But I think he can give you a very good perspective of the day-to-day -day and the benefits and some of the, the outside of the school benefits as well. So please, go for it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, again, I'm Mike Ferrer. I'm the school resource officer at Jamestown High School. I've been assigned there since August of 2015. Um, there's five SROs total and from our department. We cover all three high schools that are in the county as well as the two middle schools in the county. Um, so the day-to-day the -day operations of us isn't necessarily law enforcement purposes. Um, we, we are obviously there for law enforcement purposes when needed, but what we operate under more of is a, a mentor program. So we work closely with the students um, from across the board. We have students that are straight-A students um, that just like pop in and say hello in the morning. Uh, we will work with the special ed students that maybe are in crisis and that have grown to know us. Uh, per example, it just happened this week is Officer Shadrick at Toano. Um, the school was working with him on a, a plan for a special ed student there that is um, known to whenever they don't know how to handle a situation just go running down the hallway, and this student has attached himself to Officer Shadrick, so their plan is to have the student and his aide in Officer Shadrick's office and let the kid relax, and he just, just merely sitting there and maybe having a conversation with the officer has shown to bring him down and be able to get him back on task and back in the classroom. So, you know, and, and everything in between where it's kids that, are, you know, young people that have disciplinary problems um, or just the general, you know, Officer Furrow, hey, I came across this this weekend, or you know, I know someone that this happened to, what should they do or what can we expect from this? So we use it as a, you know, it's in our title, the resource part of it, where we, we try to keep it on a personal level. You know, the students, a lot of them know us by name. Um, they see us out in public. They see us with our families if we live in the county. And they will come up and, you know, Officer Mike, Officer Ferrer, whatever they call me in the school. And that's how they address me in public. And it happened a lot more during the pandemic. Um, you know, when the school was shut down and our unit was put on the road to assist patrol, it was more frequently we came in contact with our students outside of school because obviously we're, we were working late hours. And, you know, there's times that high school students specifically may not be the easiest to deal with when they're confronted with a police officer. And we show up on scene and they come over and we can get done what needs to get done. We may, you know, there's still consequences for everyone's actions. Um, and the students understand that, but there have been times where we will show up on scene and just that rapport we have built in the school that that student will come to me or to, you know, Officer McLaughlin from Lafayette High School and be able to work through whatever's going on. And again, sometimes it's not the outcome they want, but they just have that rapport with us where they're willing to talk and it's received better coming from us, even though it's the exact same thing the other officer is saying. So we can get the young people in the county to be more apt to work with us and even if it's in a situation where they are wrong or wronged um it we also start getting information from them where hey i heard this is going on or my friend goes to warhill and this is what i heard maybe taking place there and then i can reach out to you know that sort of there or vice versa um you know and we also do a lot of extracurricular stuff cover sporting events and the students recognize that they see us there um I have had students bring their parents up to me and introduce their parents to me and one of our, you know, our athletes from Jamestown. Um, and it, it's also something that on Monday morning we can talk about the Lafayette Warhill game and who won, what happened, why, you know, a student gets injured and they come to us. So, you know, the, the, honestly, the downside to our job is then whenever we do have to do a law enforcement action on a student or, you know, if that day ever comes, that, um, you know, the day that kind of no one ever wants to discuss. But if we, if it does come, we are the immediate first responder in the building. And, you know, to go to the other end of the spectrum where it may just be the assistant principal or the principal or, um, you know, I've seen Dr. Heron in Jamestown High School herself. And if they just have a question of just a, a change in a law or um, they're a new traffic pattern during parent drop-off, 
which if you've been around a school parent drop off, you understand sometimes that can be a, a process. So we get pulled in all these different directions and it, it goes a lot smoother working with us than, again, we, we work with the students, we work with the staff, and the staff is quicker to come to us just like the students are compared to getting on the phone, talking to Officer Jones, and they never hear from Officer Jones again. So we can follow up with stuff, we can provide more information. And again, like I said, just with the students, when, they're out, when we're out in public or at these sporting events, it's the same, it's a professional relationship, um, but you get to know them on a different level. It's just, I always tell, you know, when people ask me what's my favorite part about my position is, it's a different type of police work. So, you know, we, we, like I said, we go in and we may have to take enforcement action, but it's more of a learning and a teaching for the student or the parents or the staff sometimes based on what the situation is. Um, you know, but we try to limit our enforcement in the schools, even if it's, for example, two students get into a little bit of a fist fight in the hallway. I may have to stay, step in to break it up, um, but once everything is calmed down, the school division takes over and they will do their investigation and they will come back to us and we will work together. And a lot of times, you know, if, depending on how severe it is, if we try to defer when appropriate to the school division and let them implement things based off of code of conduct instead of us just going in and constantly having, okay, well, Virginia code says this, this is what we're gonna do. So we try to make sure that the school division comes first when appropriate. Like I said, there are times that, that may not be possible, um, but we try to keep it so that they have control and then once we have to step in, it's, it's justified at that point. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's probably one of the best positions in the police department, to be honest with you. And like I said, it's just the, the interaction with the students and when you see a student have that aha moment because they sat down and talked with you, it may be the 10th time you've had to tell them the same thing, but once it finally clicks and now you see them get back on task and they're not roaming the hallways as much, or if they are getting upset, instead of lashing out and running down the hallway doing whatever they want to do, they may get up and leave their classroom and come to me, which again, I still have to go to admin and say, yeah, you know, Johnny ran out of the classroom, he may have said something inappropriate to the teacher, I've calmed him down, here he is. Um, and I've noticed, at least with my administration at Jamestown, that that is just something that smooths over the whole process on both ends of the spectrum. Um, so just to add, all our resource officers are all DCGS qualified. It's a tightly selective process. They have to go through a process and be selected for that position. We don't appoint them. They have to check, they have to compete for that position. We take it very seriously. We, we really believe that importance and have that transparency and that relationship with the community. And that's part of working in the schools and building that relationship with the students. And when they become parents, all resource officers see them in the community and that continues that relationship within the community. So again, that's, that's, that's what it's all about. It's very important. Yeah, I personally have graduates come in the building and ask for me, see if I'm still there. Um, if they see me out in public, hey, you're still at Jamestown, what's going on? So the graduates will return and talk to us. Um, you know, and then uh, speaking with the chief just said about the community part of it is we also do different programs that are geared, most of our programs are kind of geared towards the middle school. Uh, for example, like Cops Camp, we do twice a year. Um, and it's a, a community outreach program for the middle schoolers where we take them for a week and we do all kinds of different things to include a community service project that they have to build up to at the end of the week. And right now we work with dream catchers and providing donated items to them. But we also do, it's called a police pathfinders program for the kids who have aged out of the cops camp program. And that's basically our high schoolers and we take them once a month and put them through a little bit more rigorous stuff than we do the cops camp kiddos because they're a little too young, but in years past, like, we have taken them, take them to our firing range. And we've had put them through different things, show them how to do a traffic stop, let them do a traffic stop on us, not on the general public. Um, and then <laughs> this year we have implemented as well, a we've, we're calling it um, parent workshop. And we sat down one day and we decided that, you know, we go into these driver's ed classes and we teach the students about DUI, or we go into the government class and teach them about Fourth Amendment and explain to them why the police can't search you but school security or an administrator can. And then we realize that we never explain this to the parents. So when we get phone calls in our office and a parent's upset as to why the police searched their child, meanwhile I was a school security officer, this is our chance of kind of getting the parents to come and if, you know, if they want to and sit down with us and it'll be a basically here's why we do what we do. And um, right now we're looking starting in January and once a quarter, each quarter is gonna have a different topic. In fact, I believe our first one is Fourth Amendment search and seizure. 
and then moving forward, we're going to try to do it more, fre more, excuse me, more frequently depending on their reception from the parents. So this way we're going to try to reach out to the parents as a unit from the police department and say, we're in your kids' schools, here's why we do what we do, and you can expect to see this or hear this from us in these events. Barney, any questions? Let's, let's I would just like to say we are very blessed to have a wonderful police department here in James City County. We cannot thank all of you enough for your service and what you do, but it takes a special gifting to work with kids. And um, I appreciate all you do to be there to yes, be a support system and guide them and just be there for them. So thank you very much for, yes, for doing what you do. Yes, ma'am. My pleasure. Um, I would just like to say that I, first of all, I would have appreciated if we were going to do this. I think this is very important. I think we should have invited the schools in and heard from some of the principals um, about how the SROs are impacting. Um, because I think if it's a true partnership, you know, and... I think what's happening around the country, unfortunately, is it's, an, it's been a very knee-jerk reaction um, because you are, first and foremost, a law enforcement officer, and I'll be the first to tell you and hope that my 30-year-old son is not watching, but when he was in high school, um, you know, he did not realize, he did not get in serious trouble, so let me say that right now. I don't want to impact any future employment. Um, but, you know, he's he did not understand that the job was that you are a police person first. Um, but that said, it's such an important way, I think, for children, which they are, to, to have to start having a positive relationship with a law enforcement officer and working together. And so I'm just a very big believer in community policing, and I believe we do a really great job of that here in James City County, understanding it doesn't happen that way everywhere, but I am sorry, I've read about several places in Virginia that they have stopped the SRO program, and, I, and I'm sorry to see that, because I, I think before you you do that, you have a conversation, you make sure that, that you're always talking about ways that it can be improved, rather on our side or the school side or whatever, but you definitely talk about the benefits. So um, I very much appreciate, and I think the county has been so good. I know when I was on the school board, we had one, an SRO at middle schools, yes. Um, the city didn't, it, for a long time, it was part-time at Berkeley. I think it's full-time now. Yes, but James City County has invested in this program yes, um, for many years. And so it's, it's great to hear about the relationships that you have and, and see that paying off. So thank you. Thank you, yes, ma'am. Ma thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate thank very you. much. Yep. All right, next we'll move into number two. FY 2021 year end financial update. Ms. Day, welcome back. <laughs> good afternoon again. The good news is I'm going to tackle uh, both of these together, fiscal okay. year 2021 <laughs> as well as 2022. Great. Hopefully my mouse is working here. Here we go. All right. So as we've done each quarter, this afternoon I'll provide an update on the county's finances, both for last fiscal year, fiscal year 2021, which just <laughs> ended on June the 30th, and I'll also provide an update on the first quarter of this fiscal year, fiscal year 2022, which covers the period July 1st through September 30th. As we've done in the previous updates, we'll start with the revenue side of the general fund, which is also known as our operational fund. We are currently in the midst of our year-end financial audit, and so these numbers are still considered preliminary. Having said that, we have recorded all of our year-end adjustments that we're currently aware of, so we don't expect these numbers will change, um, certainly not significantly. And as a reminder, these figures that we'll be discussing today do not include any COVID funding. So it does not include our CARES Act funding, which was about $15 million, or our ARPA funding, which was also about $15 million. And it also doesn't include all the other grants uh, for the most part that we receive. This is truly the general fund. Those grants are all accounted for separately so that we don't commingle what we consider more one-time funding with our ongoing operational financials. 
As you can see, the county fared very well in, compar in comparison to both the budget as well as compared to last fiscal year, which would have been fiscal year 2020. The budget, of course, was adjusted downward, uh, about 10% because of the anticipated impacts from the pandemic. The county did begin to recover slowly uh, the second half of fiscal year 2021. In the general property taxes category, that includes primarily our real estate and personal property taxes, which also held very strong. Uh, you heard the Commissioner of Revenue state earlier uh, that the personal property is up quite a bit. We are seeing that more on the used car side of things versus the new cars. This is also um, one of the areas that the Treasurer believes benefited by the county absorbing that credit card convenience charge. It mm -hmm. allowed them to continue collecting at a record high um, and also serve the public. Also in this category is the public service revenue. This is where we saw um, a pretty substantial bump, which will be ongoing, from the Skiffs Creek coordinator, connector excuse me, that is now fully operational. Other local taxes is where our tourism-related taxes reside, um, the health tax, both sales taxes that we collect, our meals tax, as well as our lodging tax. We'll discuss that in a little bit more uh, detail in a moment. Could you also, when you go into the, could you speak to the earlier conversation regarding the zip codes? I will, Thank absolutely, you. with the sales tax. So this slide really presents the same information that the numbers uh, reflected. Fiscal year 2021, again, was up in every year, in every category last year, except for the licenses, permits, and fees category. This is uh, due to a decline primarily in the business licenses area. That's not surprising. Uh, our business licenses uh, taxes are paid in arrears. So what we collected in fiscal year uh, 2021 was for calendar year 2020, when we really started seeing the impact from the pandemic. Okay, to narrow our focus down a little bit to the harder hit areas due to the pandemic, this is a snapshot of how our major tourism driven revenues fared. I've mentioned in previous updates how our taxes in this category, again, are collected in arrears. Uh, our sales tax is always two months behind. Our meals and lodging is always one month behind. Given now that we're in October, we actually are looking at a full 12 months worth of collections. And again, overall, we did very well, um, given all the challenges that our businesses were facing uh, from the pandemic. Sales tax was a huge saving grace for us. Um, as you can see, it did hold very strong. Um, and it, it has even recently started to exceed pre-pandemic levels, um, perhaps because of the sales tax that, of course, now is being collected on Internet sales. Um, we can also speculate that our households are using some of their stimulus money that they received um, as a result of the COVID relief packages um, and just other forms of disposable income, tax refunds, items of that nature. I did mention earlier, as it relates to sales tax, um, as you know, the, the taxes on internet sales is fairly new to us, so there hasn't been a, a whole lot of information that's been provided. But I did want to mention about two years ago, um, the Commissioner of Revenue Finance and IT embarked on a collaborative project um, to really dive a little deeper into the sales tax that's being collected on our brick and mortar businesses, those with a physical address um, within the county. And basically what we did was we were able to retrieve the information from the state on individual businesses and compare that to our GIS mapping system. And what that allowed us to do was really zero in on their location. And we did find some things. Um, we found, in particular, some larger grocery stores that had a location in the county and also had a location in the city, but they filed one corporate tax return. The, the one corporate tax return was filed in the city, but part of those taxes belonged to the county. We filed an appeal, and we were able to go back three years since the business opened and retrieve our sales tax. So it was a very beneficial project. I will say those conversations, at least at the finance director level, have continued. Um, I have a very good relationship with the city finance director, um, and it's a very honest relationship. I know that they review their data with their commissioner revenue, and I try to do the same with ours, um, and isolate, at least for the brick and mortar, where we are seeing things that we question. Um, we certainly have our radar on any businesses that open and close. 
Um, that's kind of the low-lying fruit. So when we know something's opening, we immediately look and make sure that those collections are, those taxes are being collected and paid to the county. Um, we do all have associations. Um, the commissioner talked about that earlier. I know that this is a topic of discussion that happens at the Treasurer Association. It also happens at the Finance Officer Associations. We're not the only locality with this dilemma. Uh, we are one of the few that have this dilemma at this level. Uh, one of the things we've talked about, um, rather than changing zip code, is even if it just said James City County instead of Williamsburg, when the 23188 or 23185 show up, that that might at least help identify some of those businesses. I think you'd have an easier time changing the zip code because I think people are that have been here forever that live in James City County but very much feel that they, you know, it's not just the city, Williamsburg, that it's, you know, they've lived, I think you'd, you'd find it. I'm a little, I'm a little upset that it, it doesn't seem to be, you know, it's like, oh, it's 10 year. Okay, this is a lot of money. I mean, mm -hmm. we need to, <laughs> we need to get this figured out. And I'm surprised, I, I, I hope the commissioner's revenue are taking this seriously and working with, I understand that I'm not asking, I understand they don't have a relationship with the post office. But there has to be a way that we can work with our general assembly. We can work with someone. I know that we've been at events before where we've had our Congress people, and we've tried to. I know the the uh, Commissioner of Revenue, uh, Laura Overy, has talked to uh, Congresswoman Elaine Loria about it. So I mean, I if there's a way that we can help up here to to try to get this going. I mean, we certainly don't need another 10 years. Let's, especially with, I mean, there's just more and more purchasing happening online. I mean, I'm a great example. I, you know, it's embarrassing the number of those cardboard boxes that show up at my house. I mean, and it's everything from, from soap to clothing. I mean, it's just, it, it's just easier these days. So, um, anyway, but, um, so I, I hope that's something we can continue to work on. I agree. So uh, let me, I, I don't want to prolong this too much because I don't think we're going to come up with a solution for it today, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, it, so if I order something from Amazon, um, it knows to charge me because I um, live in uh, James City County, the state sales tax, the local share of that state sales tax, and the historic triangle tax? It's interesting you bring that up. I This is from my own personal experience. I do not have insight into the daily information. That's more on the Commissioner of Revenue side. Mm -hmm. But I know as a personal shopper, I often look on for the 1% historic triangle tax and whether that's being charged, and it's all over the place. Uh -huh. There uh -huh. are some businesses that do and some businesses that don't. So that would be also, regardless of which locality, right. No one's receiving that. Yeah. Mm. Which adds a whole new dimension. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. So in terms of the lodging and meals taxes, um, again, these are two areas, as you know, we were hit very hard during the pandemic. As those restrictions on our businesses, again, started to soften, we saw Bush Gardens reopen, as well as several retail establishments and restaurants. Our hotel occupancies also started to improve. And although our meals tax here was down in actual collections um, from last year, that's primarily because the pandemic didn't hit until the last quarter of that previous year. So we had nine months of regular collections in fiscal year 2020 and only three months of the pandemic. In 2021, we had the pandemic for most of the year. Again, this graph really provides the same tra trend data. It's just easier to see um, with the blue highlights, the darker blue um, that we have improved in, in all of these areas with meals tax slowly catching up. Flipping over to the expenditure side, um, just as a reminder, what we consider our actual numbers, again, are unaudited figures at this point. It does include actual expenditures. It also includes outstanding purchase orders or commitments at the end of the year. And again, um, most of our budget is made up to our fund, made up of funding to our school division, which is about 54%. Um, and then the next largest piece is for our personnel um, at 27%. As you can see here, all of the departments did come in under budget. 
which is commendable given that the budget was already reduced by 10% from the previous year's budget. Most of the departmental savings were from personnel. Uh, in the Parks and Rec area, when I was talking about revenue earlier, uh, I mentioned that the charges for services was down quite a bit due to the suspension of several county programs due to COVID. Here you can see they also had expenditure savings from not running those programs. So that helped to offset that revenue loss. I also want to draw attention to the James City County uh, School Division side, uh, $10.2 million savings. That reflects the school division's year in surplus that you heard earlier. That was about $8.1 million. Uh, that money does revert back to the county for spending plan purposes or as a reserve for future spending at the school, di school division. The balance of that represents debt service savings. Um, as you recall, during the pandemic, we delayed all of our capital projects. The schools did the same. As a result of them delaying those projects, we didn't issue any new debt. We had programmed for debt service. And so that is savings that will roll into our fund balance. And then finally, the contributions to outside entities and transfers to others. Um, most of that savings there, that $2.3 million, was from lower health and dental claims. Um, I'm happy to report that because that's not always the case, but we suspect that our claims were down for a number of reasons. The mask certainly helped. Um, being socially distanced also helped, but we also think that major surgeries were postponed. That tends to be a big driver in our claims, um, and a lot of the hospitals and doctors weren't performing those procedures during the pandemic. That balance, it was about $1.5 million, will roll into our health and dental reserve. That's also a set aside, which can be used in future budgets to help control um, the cost increases. So bringing all of that together, we talked about revenues and expenditures separately. Um, again, total revenue was about 218 million. Our expenditures were about 192 million. That resulted in an overall surplus of $26.5 million. I talked about some of those savings being set aside for reserves, um, about $9.8 million. That reflects that health and dental reserve, but it also reflects set-asides in your 2022 budget, our current budget, that was set aside during the budget cycle for um, debt payments as well as CIP projects, our pay-as-you-go projects. We also talked earlier tonight or this afternoon about the school year and spending plan, that $8.1 million. I believe the decision tonight was about $4.5 million of that would continue to remain in fund balance to be used um, or allocated in future budgets. And then what is left over, about $8.6 million, went to our unassigned fund balance. And that's exactly what it sounds like. It's not assigned for anything specific. It would be used at your discretion. Um, we do have fiscal policies that require that we remain we maintain a 10 to 12 percent balance of our total expenditures as a reserve rainy day type fund. We use that to help us get through things like this pandemic. It's basically cash flow. It also helps us get through um, emergency disasters, natural disasters until we can get our recoveries from FEMA. Uh, we currently are at about 17 or 18 percent, so we are above um, our policy there. I did want to mention of that $8.6 million, um, the board did take some action earlier this fiscal year um, to purchase some property at the courthouse for about $7 million. That would come out of that $8.6 million. So even after that expenditure, we're still adding about $1.6 million. I had a question if I could. Yes. Um, how are you how often are you looking at things like workman's comp claims um how we're looking against what we've budgeted for you know not j just medical but time off accident prevention how mm -hmm. how often are we are we looking at doing a deep dive into that so our risk management department is a division within finance it's a shared service with the school division so we provide workers compensation services to the school division as well as the county um, we have formal meetings once a month um, we recently purchased, I say recently, it's probably been about two years, um, we purchased some new software to help us do some more data analytics to see if we could identify trends. 
Um, one example of that would be the school division. When we were looking at their worker comp claims, we were trying to identify, are there certain schools where things are happening more often? Is there a certain classroom where things are happening more often? And we were able to discover that there was one school in particular that had quite a few more accidents than, say, the other schools. That's information we share so that when they're making their budget decisions and allocating resources, hopefully that'll be something that they can consider um, and getting some more help in the classroom. So our official meetings are once a month where we go over that information. Um, in the last year and a half, we've also included our insurance provider, which is Vacorp. That's been extremely helpful because we can be more preventative and proactive by them being involved and them hearing. Um, they often make suggestions of training programs that they offer that are free. It's part of our premium that we pay them um, or just what they see statewide and nationwide. So we can do some more, um, like I said, preventative type items. I will say during the pandemic, workers' comp claims were down substantially, particularly for the school division. Um, and so we were, um, we did receive a rebate um, in fiscal year 20, a part of our premium, and we also received a reduction in our premium for this fiscal year. Thank you. Um, could so you, could, could you just, um, one, one uh, little factoid that I, I, I'm not sure whether you told it a specific number or I just missed it. Uh, you talked about the uh, Skiffs Creek uh, switching station and, and how it had produced additional revenue for the um, uh, property taxes? It's about $2.2 .2 million on an annual basis of additional revenue. Yep. Is it worth it to you, Joan? <laughs> <laughs> Light it up. <laughs> no, but I, 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 know how, <laughs> I know it should be spent. <laughs> So switching over to the current fiscal year and also starting with revenue, uh, in terms of total revenue thus far this fiscal year, we are up about a million dollars compared to this same time period last year. Most notably, this is from better results from our tourism-related tourism taxes. So we're starting to see the recovery in our meals taxes and our lodging taxes come to fruition. Um, a few items I did want to draw your attention to first, as you heard earlier, um, the new cigarette tax has been enacted. Um, we did receive our first allotment of that. I believe it was in mid-August or so. Um, when I ran this report, it was through September 30th. And so the collections at that time was 100, 130,000. I believe the commissioner mentioned about 170 through October now. Um, the revenue stream for that cigarette tax, at least in the 22 budget, has been earmarked for CIP. And so that is where those funds are going. Second is the decrease in the state and federal revenue of 1.4 million. You'll see a reduction there. This is because of the change in the accounting for the sales tax for education. Those dollars used to come to the county and then we would remit that to the school division. It now goes directly to the school division. I also wanted to mention um, in the budget column for the fund balance at $7 million, that was part of that $8 million from fiscal year 21 that was used this year to purchase the courthouse property. So that's what that represents. Again, that's a good use of fund balance. It's a one-time capital purchase, and it saves us money on the debt service side, which is a long-term commitment. Again, looking at our excess taxes, again, this is the area most heavily hit during the pandemic. Um, again, given their rearage in the collection of these taxes, these numbers actually only re reflect one month for sales tax. It would be July sales tax that we collected in September. And it, it reflects two months of lodging and meals tax, which would have been July and August that we collected in August and September. You can see the vast improvement over last year during the height of the tourism season and the effects that the pandemic had on our area. Um, those summer months and even the fall are really our biggest months. And so this is one of the areas in the budget where things don't come in evenly. We get the bulk of this revenue in, the, in that warmer time period. So that's why we're seeing such a dramatic increase there. Keeping in mind, again, that people eat out more when they're out and about. So with schools being back in session, um, but within the in-person learning, sports resuming, uh, we are ca cautiously optimistic that hopefully what we're seeing now will continue to improve. 
And then again, on the spending side of the budget, noting again, not all expenses come in evenly, um, but if they did, we'd expect three months of the year that we'd be at about 25% of our budget. You can see overall, we're a little under budget at 23.6%. This uh, line graph is just a quick way to see where all the individual departments um, are landing. The green line is the 25% benchmark. Um, I did want to zero in on a couple of those that are above budget, um, just to explain why that may be the case. Public safety is above the threshold, and that's primarily because of the radio maintenance contract. That's about $1.4 million. It's a big ticket item for them, and we've paid 50% um, of that in full. So that's why that's tracking above 25%. I also wanted to mention they have several pieces of equipment where the maintenance contract is due in July, and so those are also paid in full at the beginning of the year. One thing that we are watching very closely is the price of gas at the fuel pump. That was not foreseen at this time last year or even during the budget process, so we are watching that. They are tracking a little high there, um, but we believe overall that we'll still be able to, to come within the, the allotted budget. Financial admin is also running above budget. Um, every year at this time, we're always a little bit higher than the 25%. That is because our insurance premiums to our carrier is due in full in July. It's also because we're in the middle of our audit right now, and all of those services are paid for uh, in the first part of the year. So that'll start to even out. And again, IT is also above the 25%, really the same reasons as public safety. A lot of equipment and maintenance contracts are paid in full in July. The other category here includes funding to our outside agencies. Um, most of them receive their funding at the beginning of the year. So again, that's why we would be above the 25%. This also includes transfers that we make to other funds. Um, and a lot of that is done at the first of the year as well. And that is it for me. That really concludes my remarks, but I'm happy to respond to any questions you may have. Questions? No question, but uh, I thank you for the comprehensive nature of the presentation and uh, for the good news that you're bringing us. <laughs> Definitely. Much better Any position. <laughs> Anyone? Well, that was very thorough. And no questions, that's always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Financial forecast. Mr. Rogers, welcome, sir. Good afternoon. How you been? Just numbers are very small. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, no, yeah. Thank you. Not that we really want to get into the small numbers. We also have no lights, so that's not helping. <laughs> but we are going to uh, give you a, a big picture overview of kind of where we are. So the last time we talked, I think, was back in January, which is hard to believe. It seems like it was just here. Um, it shows how time has been flying. Um, but since that time, we've been working with uh, both Sharon and Cheryl and, uh, and, and my staff, we've been working through the model, working, uh, trying to modify it to your needs. And uh, where we are now is uh, we're really starting to dig into the assumption. So what we're going to talk about today and the things you're going to see today are very preliminary at this point. But I uh, kind of want to give you an update on where we are. So just as a, a reminder, so this is a model that we've built that basically will go out five years. We do have the ability to push it out further if we need to at some point. But at the moment, we're just really looking at five years. Now this gives us a, uh, basically it's set up like your budget. So it's got every line item in your budget. Um, it is just general fund at this point, but it includes uh, contributions to the school division, the library, outside entities, transfers to other funds, things like that. Now when you do, uh, ultimately as we start going through the modeling process, you'll be able to see the full assumptions. We're not gonna get into those today. Like I said, it's very preliminary, but you'll be able to see things such as the real estate tax revenues. Um, for the moment, we've just got a generic 1% for non-reassessment years, 2% for reassessment years, just to, as we're starting to, again, kind of work out the kinks of the model. Um, you'll also be able to make cost of living adjustments across the board, but you'll also be able to make some adjustments within certain line items, and we're going to give you an example of that um, later in the presentation. Um, we'll also be able to note certain anomalies. For instance, to remind ourselves that we went through the crazy pandemic year, and, th and that was something that, you know, three or four years now, hopefully we've you know, almost forgotten, but we'll see. Um, and again, one of the things that we'll be able to, to adjust is as you uh, bring on other capital projects, which may have operational expenditures that comes with it, we'll be able to add those specific uh, numbers into the line items where appropriate. And 
now I'm sitting here talking without moving the screen, sorry. Um, so the first page here of this is, is really the big picture summary. Now we, you can see what we've got is a couple years of actual. We've got the adopted budgets, and then we've got the projected budgets. Now one of the things that we'll be doing as we go forward is um, as the, the numbers become audited uh, for 2021, we will, uh, of course, update that year. Um, but, but at the moment, what this shows you is the, the big picture summary. And I'll point you to where we've uh, highlighted the green line there shows you the bottom line. So again, we've got some very basic assumptions in there, preliminary assumptions for expenditures as well as revenues, as I mentioned. Um, but what you'll see is at the moment, the expenditure assumptions that we've got in there are outpacing the revenue. So yeah. as a result, you'll see negative numbers starting in 2023. And of course, that's compounding over time, which is why those numbers continue to grow. So that was the big picture summary. This is a, a snapshot of the revenues. So what you'll see is, as, as Sharon was just going through, the general property taxes, you can see that here's the general property tax line by line, real estate, personal property, so on. Then you've got your other local taxes um, and then the various taxes that go on in each of those. Again, this is more of a snapshot of those, but you can see the account codes that basically will match up with your budget system and your accounting system. And then we get over into the expenditure side. So this is a, a summary at the departmental level. So you can see uh, as a snapshot of just a few here, general administration, court services, public safety, um, and then it's got the various uh, departments there underneath each. Then we break it down further. Here's an example of the Board of Supervisors and the County Admin. Again, this is what you would see if you really dug into the budgetary side of things on a line-by-line -line basis. You've got the salaries, then you've got full-time salaries, fringe benefits, and so on. So here what we've done is we've summed them up. So this is like a, a summary of by what we call object code, part of the accounting side. So you're seeing the salaries basically across all departments. Um, and, and so what we can see there is we can actually make a change and say, okay, we're going to increase all salaries, let's say, by 1%. But if you so choose, you can go and dig back down into a certain department and say, okay, we're going to, let's for example, increase public safety by one and a half percent, a half percent more. So we have the ability to make those adjustments if needed. This page basically shows you on page seven is the debt service fund. Uh, of course, we have the existing debt service, but we also have uh, projected debt service based on the CIP that you have adopted and new, is new issuances that uh, are projected into the future. So we've talked about uh, just showing you a quick example. Um, so our first scenario, which is basically what you've seen up to this point, is that all salaries are increased by 3% across the board. And so we wanted to show you that, hey, what, what does it look like if, for instance, it, or this, you know, this may be a work session down the road as you're going through the budget, and you say, what happens if we wanted to add an additional 2% just for public safety? What, is that, what, that, what does that dollar look like? So we wanted to give you an example of kind of what you might see. So again, this is very similar to the page we saw earlier. In fact, it's exactly the same numbers. Here's a graphic presentation of it. Maybe easier to see where rather than getting out all the details, you can kind of see graphically the blue line being total revenues, and then you've got the uh, various bar colors that, uh, that go with basically total operations, contribution to the schools, things like that, debt service. And then you've got the bottom line down there where you can actually see total revenues versus expenditures and then whether you're uh, in, in the negative or you're in the, in the black. So our scenario two, here again, now we've just increased public safety by an additional 2% on top of the three. This shows what those amounts are going to jump to. And then going on to page 14, this is basically a summary of the two. And what we're showing you is a, that the difference between those two scenarios Basically, in, in uh, 2023, amounts to about $300,000, but with the compounding, because again, we're assuming this happens each and every year, which may not be the case, but just again, just for this example, it compounds to about $2 million by the time you get out to 2027. 
So hopefully what the idea is that as you're sitting here and you're saying, you know, what if we do this or that, if you're sitting into a, into, in a work session with the model, basically right here you can sit there and dynamically go in and make a couple of edits and see what it looks like. So where we are now is, again, we're working through uh, the assumptions. Um, Sharon and Cheryl actually have the model and are, are going through and, and tweaking things. Uh, we've, we think we've got everything matched up in terms of the accounting side of it, in terms of matching up with your budget um, and, and the, uh, the object codes and things like that. So it's really just tweaking uh, um, any assumptions that we have at this point. So it's really ready to, to be put, put to use and, and to move into prime time, I think. Um, again, we've still got to update the 21. Uh, audited figures, so that'll be something that we'll get as soon as those numbers are finalized, and then uh, we expect uh, that'll be something you'll be able to use as you get into your, your budget time. So, happy to, to answer any questions you might have. Questions? On, on these two scenarios, by 2023, we're going in debt. And this isn't unusual, because at this point, we've, we've got some assumptions out there that are going to be very preliminary, right. but we've assumed very preliminary, uh, you know, Real estate at basically one and two percent. Um, you know, you know. Obviously, there's. We could probably sit here and talk about that all afternoon yeah. about where we might s see things going because we're in unusual times here. We've seen obviously uh, housing. The housing market is going crazy. You know, s some of us who are also already thinking ahead might say, well, what's going to happen in the future too? You know, at some point, this is this is, this madness has got to slow down a little bit, I would think. Um, but at the moment, that. You know, two percent reassessment may be very, very conservative. So now, uh, something different that's connected to our budget. What do you see? And I know this crystal ball at economists, you know, usually answer this question. Financially, where do you see the United States? And all that'll definitely see where James City in the next year or two. What worries should we be addressing and looking at? as a board to protect the county yep. and make sure that we're on strong footing so we don't lay anybody off. We went through the pandemic yep. and the staff and everybody did a great job with that. But now we're getting ready to go into possibly a recession, depression, who knows that's coming. Right. It's, it's on the horizon. But well, what do we do as a board right. to try to insulate us as best as possible? Well, going back to – it's. Perfect timing, seeing the, the 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 you know kind of where you stand. Having that extra fund balance is going to be key. Yes. You know, being able to um, not go. You don't want to go out and, and spend that quite yet until we kind of see where things are going to land. I think the biggest thing is you start thinking about budget. That I'm hearing, talking to lots of other clients and, and localities, not just in Virginia but other states, is is uh, is the talent pool and being able to keep that talent pool. You you lost some very good. Um, you know, employees today who have been around a long time that that were ready to retire, and we're starting to see more and more of that going on as people are, for various reasons, retiring. Maybe early, maybe not. Um, having finding that talent to bring in is getting very, it's getting more and more difficult across all areas of you know employment. Um, and I think what's going to start happening is we're going to see some inflation at the employment level, wage in, wa wage inflation, and so as a result. You got to take. You don't want to lose your good talent, and so I think that's something that you might really have to face as you start getting into your budget this year. That's probably the biggest thing I've seen out there. I mean, from a from a you know interest rate standpoint, things like that. I'm you know it, interest rates are supposed to be going up. We've said that for about four years yeah. now, <laughs> and they've done nothing but go down. It does. Uh, the crystal ball is a lot cloudier right now than I think as I stood here a year ago, possibly. Um, it's unknown kind of what's going on. We've seen a little bit of interest rate uh, going up in the last, I'll say, month, um, but it's we've kind of hit a little, another plateau. I think I think part of it is that going back to the job area, there's a, a big unknown out there as to what's going on with um, with the, with every everywhere. Um, there's there's this whole there's this void of where the people where did the people go, um, and a lot of jobs that need to be filled. That was so. our ten to twelve percent, but I, I call our little safety nest. Right. That that we're keeping. I know for bonding and all that, that's a good spot to be in and yep. and all that. But I've always pushed that maybe we have a little bit more in there. Um, I don't think it changes anything on our bond rating as much as far as okay, you're at a good level right yeah. there. So having more is a great thing, but 
it's not going to change your bonding or anything else and make you any any better in that and, and we're good in that absolute correct. capability but yep. should we be putting should we up that to 14 for from a, a few policy years? standpoint uh -huh. i don't think we need to change the policy but it can't hurt as an unofficial policy that you guys say well let's keep a little more right now until we figure out where we're headed and are we going to go you know are we going to really backslide into some type of recession down the road because of this unusual inflation that we're seeing right now yeah um, that worries me you know of course, we have less employees than we had before, but making sure that if we do run into hard times, we can hold our employees that we have and keep the services going. And if we put it away now, that gives us the ability to, to and, and the staff has done a great job in cutting back during mm -hmm. during this pandemic and, and slicing everything they could slice. And But that affects staff as well and, and affects services and that sort of thing. So I just okay. want to make sure that we covered enough that, you know, in case we need to put it in there, because, you know, if you have it, you tend to spend it. If you put it in exactly. savings, it kind of gets locked away and never gets talked about. Well, and the, and the other side, too, is the projects that you're going to want to do are probably going to have some inflation going forward as well, whether it be wage inflation for those empl for those who are putting bids in to, to hopefully win that business um, across the board. You know, I think there may be some, some capital project inflation out there as well and so some of that fund balance that may be used for pay go projects you're going to need that little extra on t in that unassigned fund balance as well for things like that so it's almost like everywhere having a little bit extra can't hurt right now with the uncertainty that's out there because you know one day folks are going to be studying these few years from an economic standpoint right now we're all i think a lot of us are scratching our heads trying to figure out what's going on <laughs> i know we are <laughs> yeah any other questions? Thank you. I appreciate it. You bet. All right. American Rescue Plan Act use of funds. Mr. Stevens and Ms. Day, y'all are doubling this up? We are, Chairman Hipple, members of the board. I, I do want to pass out. You have to share with this uh, spreadsheet with you before, but I thought I'd share a paper copy so you can have it in front of you and talk from. Uh, Sharon was going to talk a little bit about the process and how we got to this. So I'd ask her to take you through that while I'm passing these out, and then we'll talk a little more project by project. <laughs> Welcome again. Good evening again. <laughs> so I want to just kind of talk about how we got to where we are today um, with the ARPA request um, from the departments. Uh, in August of this year, FMS developed a process for the departments to officially submit requests for consideration of ARPA funding. It was very similar to the process that we use for our nonprofits with our CARES allocation. A link to our request form was provided on our website and provided to the departments. And departments were asked for a variety of information, part of which included which of the four ARPA criteria did their submission meet. And as a reminder, those criteria were responding to the public health emergency and its negative economic impacts, responding to workers performing essential work during the pandemic, for the provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue, and fourth, to make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. As part of that process, we received a total of 33 requests for a total ask of $36 million. The requests were submitted by every department and as a reminder, our allocation of ARPA funding was only about $15 million, of which we received the first half in May of 2021, and we expect to receive the second half in May of 2022. In order to vet those requests, a review committee was formed. It was comprised of members from finance as well as county administration, and consideration was given to whether the request qualified for ARPA funding how the department ranked its own request. We had several requests um, from one department. How did they rank it? If they submitted five, was it their first request or their fifth request in terms of priority? Whether it had been submitted and vetted in past budgets, or if this is the first time we had heard of this type of request. If it was in the budget, was it in the operating budget or was it in the CIP budget? And if it's in the CIP budget, does it free up general fund money, or is it debt funded? And then whether there were any other funding sources, such as grants or other federal and state ARPA money, 
the federal government and the state of Virginia has its own ARPA allocation. And so we wanted to make sure we were looking at that versus solely our local ARPA allocation. And from there, a summary of our discussion was compiled in the form of a spreadsheet, which I believe uh, you now have before you. And as I mentioned, of those 33 requests, 20 of those um, have been recommended for funding. It was spread across all the departments. And just to give you kind of an idea, we had six requests that came in from housing, primarily workforce, housing task force recommendations. Economic development submitted three requests. Social services had three, finance had one, general services had six, IT had three, parks and rec had four, the treasurer had two, police and fire in total had three, and community development had two. That made up the 33 requests, and again, the recommendations were made um, pretty much spread the same way um, throughout those departments. That's really my remarks tonight to sum up the process on, on where we are. I know there are members here um, from ELT to answer any questions you have, including myself. Can you please read the uh, four parameters yes. again? Yes, yes. First one is to respond to the public health emergency or its negative economic impacts. And that would include items such as assistance to households, assistance to small businesses, assistance to nonprofits, um, impacted industries such as tourism, travel, and hospitality. The second provision was to respond to workers that are performing essential work during the pandemic by prov providing premium pay to eligible workers. We didn't have any requests that came in for that. The third provision um, was for the provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue due to the pandemic. This is what we refer to as the, the loss of revenue. And fourth was to make investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. I mentioned previously that we received about $15 million in ARPA funding. When we performed our revenue loss calculation, it exceeded that. It was roughly $17 million and some change. And so our recommendation was to use that criteria because it's the most broad. It's for the general provision of government services. And that was really our mindset as a committee when we were vetting the request. So I guess for me, it would have been helpful to know where you felt these fell into. I mean, I'll tell you right, I'm disappointed that tourism, which is took our biggest hit, you know, we've, we've given $500,000 to. I think we should have we should have given um, more money to that. Frankly, um, if if we're doing what that's site number one on the on the list here, um, but it would help to know where you feel these others where they fall into. I mean, some of them I obviously you know I obviously know the marina and things like that, but. Um, that would have helped. Sure. You know, Ms. Larson, I think in, in talking through this, we had asked departments to submit requests. So we've provided all the requests the departments submitted when we made that call to them for what they would like to see funded, whether they were currently in the CIP and not yet funded or other things that maybe hadn't made it in the CIP or other initiatives. And so that represents all of that. I think to Sharon's point, by use of the revenue loss, uh, you can make any of the any of the projects you want to. Quite frankly, you would free up the money and be able to fund an activity you want to fund. So we can go back and do a little better in categorizing them. But in talking with Cheryl, we felt all of these projects were ARPA eligible, um, and that would include all on both pages. When we talk about funding source, we were back to on the ARPA funds of trying to stay within that 14.8 or almost 15 million dollars that James City County will receive. When we talked about tourism, the only thing I had that was directly in terms of business was trying to help in a, our tourism related businesses with some type of grant program. We did that before and quite frankly I think it was successful but it took some effort to, with the 30 day fund to get all of those funds out. We're also pursuing some other CDBG type funding that's out there for business grants and so I hope that we would have more and quite frankly would recommend this really is two phases of money that we would probably push some of these to a later point in time. And you don't have to make a decision at this point on all of these projects. You can fund or give us an indication that you're supportive of some of them or none of them, and we can go a different direction with that. But it was trying to give you a starting point for these projects are ones that came from the department, and then 
the group that Sharon mentioned from administration and finance or FMS working through uh, a recommendation to the board for things that might have an impact. We'd heard an awful lot about workforce housing from the board, from uh, purchasing of some property that we then might turn into something to be developed for uh, workforce type housing, uh, to some of the more implementations of the workforce housing task force recommendation. So there's almost a million dollars in things related to workforce housing. And if we really jump on those, we did include a position to support those efforts and funded for at least this uh, four year period, three year period, depending on the program, uh, to try to help support that. And so within this list, there are four positions that again, total about a million dollars over a three to four year time frame. And I would tell you with all of them, we, would, we need them if we go forward with some of the projects. Uh, we would look at them at the end of the, the term and decide are they a permanent position or are they not. But going in, they would be meant to be a temporary position to support the need. Uh, with M FMS, there's a tremendous amount of, of additional financial work and questions and seminars and trying to make sure we're spending this money correctly. And so there's a position included in this list that would help support Miss um, Day and her staff in terms of all the additional requirements that are ongoing with the money we're receiving, which is to date, her staff has really handled well, but they have put in a lot of hours trying to keep up with that. And I do worry, again, going forward, can they continue that another three or four years on top of their existing duties? So, you know, when I look at these items, I'm happy to talk a little more one by one. We put about a million dollars into community ready things, whether it's business grants or nonprofit assistance. Uh, with the CARES money, and Ms. Day, correct me if I'm wrong, but with the CARES money, the nonprofit had to be um, providing uh, COVID related relief. And you did award grants last fall to those organizations that were nonprofits that were providing that relief. The funding this year with ARPA could be that they have a COVID-related loss or providing COVID-related relief. So it could be, and it would open up to a broader uh, opportunity for nonprofits in the community, of which many have sent you emails requesting funding. Um, and so rather than try to pick and choose from that, the recommendation would be we set aside a pot of money and create a fairly simplistic grant program for them to apply so we at least give all the nonprofits in our community an opportunity to make their case and let us consider funding if the board would want to provide. That was not an option under CARES, at least for the broader group. It is under ARPA. So that was some of the set aside of almost a million dollars there for those types of things. And then the others really fronted CIP projects, moved them forward, uh, or had some other projects that were unknown within the uh, departments that hadn't come forward as a CIP project. And we can talk more specifically about those if, as the board has interest. I'm happy to go one by one. I'm happy to let us go for another meeting. There's not a sense of urgency with many of these. There are a couple that, um, if you ask, there are about five of them. I highlighted them in the lighter blue that I would tell you I think are a little more urgent if you want to do them. The rest of them are not time sensitive. Um, I would like to talk through those. And again, the one is that nonprofit grant program. If you have an interest in us setting aside half a million dollars and developing a program, the request is out there. We have some uh, other uh, interest in organizations. And I think that's one that I'd like to be able to give an indication. Yes, we will, because it'll take us a month or two to work through that process. Um, so that's one for me. The housing financial analyst piece within FMS is quite frankly your board consideration number two. That's this position listed here. Um, for your consideration this evening, I guess is part of your action items. Uh, the marina, marina structural improvements happens to be the Billsburg building. Uh, we've talked about that having some capacity issues within the existing tap room. This really sol uh, solves that issue, and more frankly, it reinforces the structure that we have there that I think can serve the county for, I say, many more years, another five or ten years, with a fairly minimal investment in that structural support of that building. Uh, and so for me, that one is one that if we could move forward, I think would be worthwhile moving forward. On the back page, and I said five highlighted, I really meant six, but on the back <laughs> page is the elimination of some bathroom touch points. We had a project ongoing under CARES funding that we're not gonna complete in times for the CARES uh, deadline, which is the end of December because of supply related issues of getting the materials in here to be installed. I do think it's one of those areas that it makes sense to where we can make things automatic from faucets to toilets. That's an improvement for us. So for me, that one's a little more time sensitive. Um, the last, the next one of credit card uh, waiver fees really is a decision. And again, do we want to continue to extend those? And again, I think in this one, we would tell you we could find current year savings because the year is trending well, as Ms. Day had covered, that we would be able to fund those credit card uh, fees through the end of the year. But it's a fairly substantial expense. That $400,000 on six months is about $800,000 a year. Uh, it's been extremely popular. Our treasurer has gone from 
maybe, maybe not, to being very supportive and trying to figure out can we find a way to continue that. So I think we will have more discussion with you whether you extend this here or not. But our messaging to the community, you don't have to make a decision maybe at this meeting, but we need to make a decision late November at the latest so that we could be set up for what occurs beginning January 1st, if in fact we're gonna reinstate the fees. There's some uh, software programming issues on our collections that we have to change in some programs so that we're reinstating that fee when somebody makes the charge with a credit card. And then the last one that's a little more time sensitive for me is the creation of a mowing slash litter crew. I think we can do that within our current year savings as well. It will be an ongoing cost. It's about half in this year, a little more than half is equipment. And that's sort of the lead time of if we're gonna have this crew operating in the spring to do more of what we all say we wanna do from litter pickup to picking up couches that are thrown out, to going to trim bushes, to going to do. We just in general services don't have the staff to be as responsive as we ought to be. And there just seems to be more and more requests or service from that crew that we just don't have. And so some of the lead time on this is the equipment. We wouldn't physically hire people till the February, March timeframe. And so the funding beyond that is mostly the personnel side. So in this 800,000, there's two or 300,000 that is people. That turns into about an annual cost of 600,000 plus or minus. Uh, the bigger part is equipment going into that to make sure we have the trucks and mowers uh, uh, to be able to provide that service. Um, so those are the ones for me that indication of the board would like us to do them or not. The rest of them we can talk about at a later date or as you uh, might see fit. Yeah. Any questions? One of the um, um, sanitary sewer line improvements, would that be the service authorities dime to cover? Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, I think it could be. It's just that I think, certain, I think Mr. Powell would tell you they don't really have funding set aside to do that. So the answer is the ARPA funding would could would do that. Um, and what we had identified is to find a, a different funding source for that, I believe, or whether there's opportunities for that. But these were, I think, septic systems, a portion of those out there that they know are having continual problems. Right. And was trying to address those uh, issues. And a total request is $36 million and some change. And we would have to come up, if I'm reading this correctly, we'd have to come up with Almost 15 million. Um, you know, what we've recommended in here is not necessarily funding all of that. Some of these uh, things would be future type uh, CIP discussions. Right. And I've probably identified close to 10, 12, 12 or more million there uh, in terms of, and that is, so you take that off the 36, that'd get us down pretty significantly. There are other areas I think we can find it within our current year savings if the board's supportive. I just didn't want to move. Uh, forward with that. Part of that being um, in current year savings, uh, we're running uh, pretty heavy on our overtime for our firefighters. Uh, some of that's due to vacancies. Some of that's due to uh, people being injured. Some of that's due to folks just taking vacation time and trying to maintain minimum staffing levels. And we're doing that through forced overtime or voluntary into force. But we have spent a significant part of that overtime budget. And I think we'll figure out how to do that within current year savings. But it needs I think we've got to keep the staffing levels where our chief feels comfortable with that. And so those that's, are. And that's where we found four or five years ago. And it would, the overtime was eating us alive. We were able to hire more people in and pay them regular than paying time and a half to work the overtime. Right. And um, that's, a, that's a smart move to watch that because we definitely ought to put more personnel out rather than having overtime paid. I know that a lot of firefighters. Don't mind the overtime, but. Well, to a point, I think all of our staff probably appreciates the overtime. I would also tell you, I think a lot of them are, they'd rather have time off than money. Um, so. We have got them to the point they are just, they're thinking about work a lot more than they ought to think about it because when they're not here, that's their coworkers having to pick up the slack for them. And um, I know that, that over this past year we did, or past few years, we did much better with overtime in, in the fire department because we had pre-hired firefighters for the station six that we now have put off for a number of years. We've since instituted another engine company. So that company now has taken that staffing. And so where we had six extra employees that were filling some of that gap and reducing that overtime, we've lost that plus some, um, regular attrition things. We've got five or six in the academy, so they'll be out in the coming spring, but you still are six months before you get those replacement yeah. firefighters in place. So That's tough. The um, general service administration building, would would that be the one would be possibly at where we talked about earlier in the Warhill track area, moving that in that one little Yes, sir. Right there. And this okay. was really just the design piece of that, so that doesn't build the building, but right. that would let the design start of that. And again, I think that's a good project. It could ARPA could fund that, but I think it's a good project to continue within our CIP and, yeah, and move it forward that way. 
So we could we could in turn do everything that we have on this sheet front and back with ARPA and the funds that we possibly have now that we could apply to this. We believe so. Again, those uh -huh. future CIP allocations will be discussions through the budgeting process. Many of these future CIP, uh, many of them are part of the current five-year CIP, and a couple of them could be incorporated into that if, in fact, you fund, such as Lower County Park. It's one that's out there. We've talked about that over the years. We did recommend to include that um, to, to meet the demand there. We're closer, closer to having a site for that uh, in the Grove area, and so moving that funding a few years closer would then free up that CIP funding that had been allocated for that project in, I think, fiscal year 24 or 25. And if you all look down at the very bottom, the... Um, PDR program and all. Look at um, putting five million into that to get that up and started, and you know, because we've all talked about it, we've all said, yeah, how do we get an extra? Um, the only thing, I, and I haven't looked everything over in depth, but the only thing I would think that we need, we need, we need one point five million for three traffic lights, and I would, I would go to Sue and then the Ruth, and then the Jolly Pond. And I think all three of those are important. And the Jolly Pond could be the last one, but the, the ladies have two areas that are critical with, you know, problems that we ought to look at to try to, you know, put, if we can, if we can fit those, if we can fit the two ladies in, Jolly Pond can wait. If we can fit all three in, that'd be great, but... You know, it's at a half a million dollars a piece for those lights. So, and of course, then the maintenance afterwards and the upkeep and the power and all that you got to add into. Well, I don't mind uh, confirming with Paul Holt what that cost would be. For some reason, I think the Jolly Palm one meets a lot of the signal warrants. And I think that's one that we have funding in place and that we are pushing forward with that one. So I need to okay. circle back with you. I think it might be ahead of the others. We've talked about it a while. And again, it meets uh, more of the warrants for a signal than maybe the other locations. But I'll have to circle back and verify that I'm accurate in telling you that. Okay. But I'll do that. But then that way it'll get what y'all are, y'all's concerns and y'all's jurisdictions on the on the safety, on the lights. I think that would help out a lot. I agree. Thank you. I had a quick follow-up on the personnel, um, the additional overtime dollars, and wondering, um, going back to something I brought up earlier about uh, how, curious how many um, first responders we have out on um, – workman's comp issues right now and if that is playing a role in in part of this miss florson i'll verify the numbers i've not talking with with chief ash i've not sensed that that's significant in okay. terms of numbers but i certainly can provide that information to you and i'll be happy to get okay. that for thank you thank you and, and I'll, I'll give you the breakdown of vacancies we're not overly um we don't have a huge staffing shortages within public safety, but we do have a vacancy create sort of a ripple effect. And then the replacement of those uh, firefighters, particularly while they're going through the academy, we can have six that's showing full, but those six aren't able to work because they're in the academy. And so that still creates some of those issues of day-to-day -day staffing. And I'll try to get some information for you on that. I just wanted to add this. Thank you, thank you for the large sheet because I. Much more <laughs> it's and I much easier that. to read. Um, and, and I think <laughs> I, I think basically uh, what the the, the, uh, the initial goal here is to make the determination of how you want to uh, allocate the fourteen point nine eight million. Yes, sir. Uh, and this uh, looks like it does a pretty decent job of that. I think we, if you have small places where people want to tweak the numbers a little bit, that's fine. But I I I, uh, I think staff has done a really incredible job. Uh, Analyzing this uh, in, a, in a very uh, organized manner, and I basically support what you what you've done, and it lays out uh, other things that we'd like to do and how we how we would like to do them. Uh, I think that the uh, general fund savings is a, is a good use for some of these. Uh, uh, the hard part will be when we come to outside funding or or to uh, CIP, uh, and that'll that's you know we we'll just have to have to wrestle with that when we get there, but. Um, do you uh, how 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 quickly do you think you need an answer? On, do you need an answer today on those six light blue, or do you need that by the next meeting, or what? Well, the the one again, those ones that are in light blue, the sooner we could have an answer, the sooner we could move those uh, forward if the board's comfortable with them. I don't I don't 
absolutely have to have an answer today. It's just our equipment time on ordering for uh, the mowing and litter crew or the litter and mowing crew. You know, if we wait a month, that's just a month later that we get that equipment, so we can't begin the work. So it's not anything that's overly urgent, other than if we have movement or direction on those. Uh, we could put those in place. Your sooner. explanation on all of them has been very, very straightforward and on point. And I, I would, I would suggest that we uh, essentially approve, give you approval for those those six. Uh, at least I would, I would uh, think that would be uh, one of the things we we ought to do today, uh, to give you the ability to move forward, especially that credit card fee waiver thing. I think, I think what we found is that, you know, yeah, it was a big number, and but the the benefits have greatly outweighed the costs and if that's something that exists going forward uh, I don't I don't want to give that up uh, because that has uh, in my mind it seems to have really generated a quicker recovery or, or a collection of, of a lot of our, our taxes I'm in favor of supporting these six but I would agree with Miss Larson and looking at the others that the tourism program not being fully funded that that's a concern for me as well that's one of our main drivers in this area so i um i do agree with her on that but the six um, that i'm seeing here i don't have a problem supporting those today please get the mowers <laughs> yeah just saying um i did have a quick i just want to follow up the elimination of bathroom touch points you have faucets and toilets to touch free we're not going to get rid of paper towels are we Please. I mean, not getting rid of, you're talking about uh, dryers. I don't believe so. I'll, I'll verify that. It's because we have dryers are not as um, sanitary. Uh, is, thank you. Yeah. As paper towels. Correct. And I like having a paper towel to yeah. open my door. I, I don't want to see, I mean, not <laughs> to get into the nitty gritty, but I'm sorry, but it, yeah. during the pandemic, I mean, we. I'll verify that. I didn't see anything in the description that indicated we were doing that, so okay. I don't think so. Again, I've tried to make the description. Right, that's why I wanted to ask we because were doing, but I'll find out. There's been a lot of discussion about that mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Yep, the moms are concerned about that. <laughs> the journal. But I'm okay with the the six. So I I um, would certainly endorse uh, the the pr projects that you've laid out here um, in, in general terms. Obviously, there can be some tweaking of it. Uh, as far as the business, the tourism uh, side of it, I'd like to see a program. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I just don't want to say. Let's give them a million dollars. Let's give a million sure. dollars to this purpose and not really have a defined purpose that uh, is going to resonate with the tourism. Understand industry. that. So, you know, if there is something that makes sense in that regard, then that's great. Yeah. And one thing Don't I disagree. Did, oh, pardon, I'm, I'm sorry. One thing I did want to add just on the tourism note, I was on a webinar today because the state just recently announced a, a pretty substantial program for destination marketing um, areas. And of course, we're part of that list. Um, the portal and the details, our specific allocation comes out on Friday. So that was part of the mindset when we were going through the initial recommendations was, let's wait and see what the state does. That's going to DMO. I mean, that's coming here to go to to Vicky's organization for marketing. That's not going to Bush Gardens. And, and, it, and as part of her charge under her creation, she can't do a specific destination. Correct. I, I agree with you. I mean, she is hopefully going with, if all of you all can work together, we are going to see a a bounce in that marketing effort. And at the time we were doing these recommendations a few weeks ago, we didn't know that. Um, the, the frequently asked questions and the guidance hasn't been released yet. Again, that, that comes out on Friday. And so part of the thought process was, let's see what their program is. And we know as part of that process, that the DMOs have to submit a plan on how they're gonna use the dollars. And so that was kind of the thought yeah. process at the time. And I understand, that's fine. I'm, we can and then you'll let them. us know what those findings are. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all your yeah, hard work amazing. on all of this. Yeah, that's a good job, and, and very um, understanding. I, I could I could support the whole thing today. Yeah, um, without a without a problem. I think there's some good things. There's some stuff we need definitely in here, and if we can cover it financially, I could support the whole the whole program. Um, but it's board. If y'all want to just do the six and come back to it or if you want to support the whole thing i just look to y'all for who wants to make a recommendation but 
you know, I could I can make a re recommendation. I, I would I would um, uh, move that we endorse the the um, proposal in total, but authorize going forward on the six now uh, to allow for an opportunity for fine tuning of the uh, of the remaining cases, identification of funding sources. Okay. Yeah, the only yeah. thing, and Mr. Carnifax is here, and he's going <laughs> to just the Ambler House. I mean, that's yeah. just a lot of money again. I, and I, I just would wish if, if we're going to do seven hundred thirty-nine thousand in there, I'd like to know a plan. Go, going mm -hmm. so back to what Supervisor McGlennan, I just want to know a plan. There was a wedding there recently. The couple, and they loved the venue. They were willing to. You have to bring everything, water, bathroom, every generate power. Everything has to be brought there. I'd like to see $20,000 of that money help go to the outside. I mean, if, if somebody's willing to do that, to bring all of that and use it as a venue, let's use it. Um, but let's shape it up so that it looks decent. I, I mean, I just, I just want to... If we invest this type of money into that, I just want to know that we've got a, a, a plan at some point. I agree. Other than the air conditioner being in the hallway. The handler unit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all I'll say. Mr. Carnifax is going to follow me to my car. Where's that gentleman that was But I agree. Earlier? I do agree with you. you. I think I'd like to see what, it's, you. what it's going to be. So I, I also will endorse it, but just looking for a little bit more. We have a motion on the floor. Roll call. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Legislative agenda. Can, Mr. Can Kinsman. We, can we take a five-minute recess? Oh, okay. <laughs> Aye. Just, just five-minute five recess. Thank you.
sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. The moment you've all been waiting for, we have our 2022 <laughs> legislative program. Um, this is we're following the same schedule we followed for the, the past several years in which I informally bring this to you uh, at your meeting today. Uh, I get input from you guys. I'll finalize it at your meeting next month, and then we come back with your legislators at the end of November. Um, each of you, there's a there's a copy of the 2022 proposed program in front of you on uh, on the desk. You're welcome to take a look at that. Uh, I can walk through each of those if you want, or we can just let you guys have a free for all. I'm happy to do either way. <laughs> is there anything in here anyone wants to pull, or is there anything anyone may want to add? I, I yes, wanted sir. to. I wanted to. You had, in in your cover letter you'd sent us. Uh, um, you mentioned five items that you had noted over the past year. And the one uh, that we tried last year, I guess, and that your recommendation was we try a charter amendment this year, was not listed in this. And that was the one which gives uh, a charter amendment to give us the power to uh, say we'll only accept letters of, of credit or cash escrow as opposed to bonds. And, and I go back to that because we're still paying for this. We got, uh, you know, 15 years later, we still don't have settler's market bond issue settled and ultimately when we get everything done it's going to wind up costing taxpayers money it's already costed us tax taxpayers money uh, this is one that we obviously are not going to get a state law passed that would that would do so but there is a possibility that we could uh, might be able to get something through that as a charter amendment and uh, the, I, I refer back to the what was it the one we did last time was uh, dealing with the uh, uh, the Aban uh, uh, it was abandoned um, cars. Abandoned yeah. cars. Yes, sir. Yeah. Couldn't get that through the General Assembly, and then but we, we got, got it through as a charter. Amendment. We got through the charter, and so uh, I would I would hazard a guess that you know uh, abandoned cars were a problem, but they probably weren't nearly as financial impact on the taxpayers of this county as they as the bond issues, and that's especially the number of bond issues. And I defer to our esteemed legal colleague here who can. Who's gotten to be an expert in bonds? And I, 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 I doubt there are any other localities who have. Understand. I, I doubt there are any other localities who have pulled as many bonds as as this one has. Um, a bond pull is is sort of akin to an insurance claim, and uh, you know your car may be dented, and you think it should be fixed very quickly, but uh, you're going to likely argue with an insurance policy as to how that that dent is fixed, who gets to fix that dent, when that dent is fixed all of the certain things, uh, that's basically what we're doing when we do a bond pull, except you do it on a much grander scale in certain circumstances. Uh, if you're looking at a relatively simple bond pull, uh, it's something that we would, like say there's a, a little bit of infrastructure left in a neighborhood, uh, we will make a claim on the bond company, uh, we'll usually get a response back, and then there's a good amount of back and forth as to, you know, it's a bond company in Chicago, Illinois, and they're going to say, well, what's show me what's wrong. And so we go through that whole procedure about what's wrong, then they'll bring in their experts to look to see whether our engineers um, picked up the right things, then they'll figure out whether or not they want to do the work, and then they either do it or they can give us the money. We've had that happen in both scenarios. Um, not too bad when you're talking about a small neighborhood infrastructure, when you're talking about something on the size of Settler's Market, that's been 10 years now. Um, I was a much younger man when we started that bond poll, and uh, that's contributed to a lot of the gray hair. And we're really, I, I want to say we're a little further along on it, but work still hasn't happened. Well, and and it also the the, uh, the amount of time, effort, and staff uh, expenditure, it, it, it's a tremendous expenditure of taxpayer money to, just to try to enforce the surety that we have. It is probably less on my office than it is in environmental and engineering and those folks that have to go out there and do that verification for us. Uh, it's pretty easy for me to, to talk to a bond company lawyer and say, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll figure out, you know, which drop inlets are bad. Uh, but then really I pass that on to staff and they have to set time aside to go do all of that. And, and if you could maybe to refresh for us all on the board, uh, the, how substantial a difference it is if we were doing the same thing with a letter of credit as opposed to. A, a letter of credit is, is money that's set aside at the bank. And, and it's being held for us, and all we have to do is send in a letter and say uh, the magic words that were whatever in, that was in the document that was originally um, executed, which is basically um, developer Larson has failed to do those things that she said she was going to do, and I therefore demand the $15,000 that we have. At least in my experience, that check has been cut and delivered to us. The, the only thing better is a cash escrow, which so we hold. 
much simpler process. It sure. is. You're not arguing. A, a bond is basically just a ticket to a lawsuit. You're just going to argue back and forth um, with lawyers, usually in Chicago, Illinois, as to how much you should get and whether or not you get it. A letter of credit generally results in a check made out to the county pretty quickly. But, you know, I think that I, I would like to see us put it on the agenda and see if we can get it through and work with our legislators to try to do it through the charter amendment approach because clearly it's not going to go any other way. Uh, this is, I think, if we're going to have a, a, a fair shot at it, I would, I would really like to see us do, try to do it this year. You add that one to it? Yes, sir. I just wanted to mention that we had been approached by some citizens regarding a, an item on our legislative agenda, but we are waiting for a study from the Virginia Housing Commission to, so that is why it's not on our legislative agenda this year regarding um, homeowner control of HOAs, et cetera. Um, which we've dealt with a few of those here as well. And, but um, we're, it's, we've heard them. We're just, we're trying to follow the process. That's correct. We sent it up to um, uh, um, the housing study group. And I believe that they begin their meetings in earnest with the beginning of the General Assembly. And we're hoping that they'll take that up. That's given the number of issues that the citizens brought up, I, I couldn't really encapsulate them all in one code change. And so that's probably the best place to do it because it's almost an overhaul of how um, declarant controlled communities operate. Yes. And that, that's a much better group to address those broad range of issues versus us trying to come up with one or two code changes to explain to our legislators to take up there. I, I, I appreciate that approach because it is a significant problem for a lot of communities uh, in James City County, a lot of our neighborhoods in James City County. And, uh, and I think it's, it's one where our citizens are operating uh, at a significant disadvantage legally, and I, it's going to have to be something at the state level that's going to a basic philosophical change in how they approach it to protect our citizens. Yes, I've got a couple of, of uh, um, items here. Our, our um, first of all, you know, this is very streamlined, which is which is great. Um, uh, a couple of things that I'd just like to, to point to. The uh, number one one uh, is uh, I think going to probably never go anyplace because they, they, nobody's going to want to touch touch uh -huh. it. Uh, but that's okay, and we can say we'd still like okay. to see a change. Uh, I might I might suggest that either we supplement it by saying something that, that the state at a minimum should um, raise its contribution to the cost of local education. Uh, I just saw statistics uh, I think yesterday that. To, reminded us that Virginia is 41st in the country in state support per, per student, uh, and we're one of the top 10 uh, states in terms of uh, income. Uh, and of course, what that means isn't that, that we don't uh, fund our schools fairly well. It means that the burden is on local governments to do it. So uh, asking that the state uh, increase its share of the cost of, of education would lift everybody up. Um, and doesn't get us into the fight over over the uh, formula. But I'm I'm okay with having with saying we want to change the formula. But you know, right? Uh, well, you, before you even do that, let's let's just pay a little bit more. On um, number one three uh, on impact fees, uh, let me suggest that after the uh, in the second line uh, where it says fees, I'd insert some language. So it would say. The county encourages the General Assembly to revise existing impact fee laws to encourage the use of st statutorily calculated impact fees which reflect the true cost of residential development uh, in lieu of cash proffers. Just to make sure that we don't just say, okay, we're going to have impact fees, but, or, but uh, uh, they're going to be at such a low level that they don't really cover uh, the capital investment we're making. Um, I, and I, I sent you all some information about, about a request that I received from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, to encourage reauthorization of legislation that was passed this year, encouraging uh, reforestation uh, in order to increase the tree canopy, uh, help uh, absorb stormwater, uh, and reduce the, the runoff there, and uh, even make places a little cooler in the summertime, which would be nice. Uh, 
Uh, and I thought that maybe in where we talk about state funding under 1.5, uh, it would satisfy me to just uh, in, insert the word reforestation um, because uh, then, you know, that's something we could discuss with the legislators when they, when they come to say, you know, well, this is one of the things that you ought to support too, the Senate bill that was passed this, this past year with a reenactment clause uh, on it uh, for this coming year. Uh, and then the last, the only other thing that I, I thought would be helpful, um, I don't believe we've ever had a discussion of qualified immunity, and I think that if we are going to put it in our legislative packet, it would be helpful for us to, to have a background uh, piece that we can uh, refer to. Uh, uh, you know, the, the language is, is, is pretty blunt about uh, not uh, um, eliminate eliminating or otherwise reducing the qualified immunity uh, of police officers. And I think that, you know, uh, uh, if, if we're going to take that uh, uh, approach, we, we really should be able to articulate why we're doing it, what's being proposed that we're concerned about, and to recognize that, that we also uh, understand that in cases where there is um, uh, improper performance by police officers, we're not trying to, to say that that's uh, an acceptable uh, situation either. Just, I think it would be uh, useful for us to have that kind of information. Um, so I, how do we get that prior to doing that? Me. Because I'm not, um, I want to make sure that we're yeah. covering our police officers as best we can. Oh, absolutely, right, right. Yeah, no, I, I, I think everybody understands, well, maybe not everybody understands, but I, I think we all understand <laughs> the, the uh, importance of protecting our police officers from legal actions when they are engaging properly in their, in their uh, performance of an important public safety function. Uh, I just uh, think we're not going to meet with the legislators until the end of November. Um, it would be helpful to have some background on um, the, the basic issues, what's been proposed, and therefore may likely come before the legislature uh, so that we can speak about it intelligently. We'll have this and then just have a sheet behind it with talking points. Right. That's right. what you're looking for. Yeah. As yeah. Okay. I can do that. Can you can set that up? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Mr. McLennan, that was actually a, that was a late addition to yeah. our last year's agenda. We had that on there as um, we encourage the General Assembly to vote against any bills that would abrogate the qualified immunity of police officers. So this was sort of a carryover, but right. definitely worded a little bit differently. And I'm, I'm happy to get you the background of qualified immunity and the, um, <coughs> the various bills that have come before the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this. Appreciate it. Everybody good for the legislative agenda with the changes we made? Okay. All right. We need to vote on that? No, sir. I'll bring okay. back something that looks like this, hopefully, at your next meeting. All right. Thank well, you. We can thank them for the cigarette tax. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Which producing Board that. considerations. Um, authorization of a full-time position for the use of the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Can we this just day. can we just move that because we've talked about that today yeah. already? Is that okay with y'all? Oh, we're good. Yeah. All right. I'll move that motion. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. Roll call. Ms. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Consideration of the James City County Comprehensive Plan for our county. Um, our shared futures, James City County 2045 comprehensive, comprehensive plan. Ms. Cook, how are you doing today? Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. The draft 2045 comprehensive plan is before the board today for consideration following the board's public hearing on July 13th and the board's discussion on September 28th. At the September 28th meeting, the board voted to make amendments to the draft comprehensive plan on a number of items which were listed in the staff memo and attachment six of the board's packet. On the 28th, the board also asked staff to return with information about the Croker interchange area and the moderate density residential designation. Staff appreciates the opportunity to go through these two issues with the board. To begin then, the first issue is the Croker interchange land use designations. The current draft version of the county's future land use map reflects past board guidance to remove the northeast and southeast interchange quadrants from the primary service area and to redesignate most parcels rural lands with the two historic Virginia Land Conservancy parcels redesignated to community character conservation, 
open space or recreation, abbreviated here as CCOR. Staff understands from the board's discussion on the 28th that there may be direction to leave these two interchange quadrants inside the PSA. If that is the case, staff rec recommends the board consider two options. The first is shown here. This option returns 14 out of the 16 parcels at these interchange quadrants to their current land use designations of low density residential, neighborhood commercial, and mixed use. However, for the two parcels owned by the Land Conservancy, this option does include redesignation to CCOR. With this option, the draft revised language guiding the Croker mixed use area in the southeast quadrant recommends buffering these parcels as written here. The second option is shown here. This option returns all 16 parcels at these interchange quadrants to their adopted 2035 plan land use designations, including the two parcels owned by the Land Conservancy. With this option, the draft revised language guiding the Croker mixed use area in the southeast quadrant recommends buffering and because these parcels would be part of the mixed use area also includes rec recommended uses as written here. On the 28th, the board asked if the Historic Virginia Land Conservancy had input on this matter. It is staff's current understanding that the Land Conservancy is comfortable with either of these options but thought that the CCOR designation better matches the terms of the conservation easement. Further, it is staff's understanding that the Land Conservancy prefers remaining inside the PSA. If it suits the board before moving on to the moderate density residential issue, staff would be glad to pause here for any questions or board discussion of this issue. But the only question I had, uh, so it sounds like they would be comfortable with either one, but option A would basically uh, designate it uh, community character conservation. Um, and even though it's inside the PSA, um, will that still give them the flexibility to do uh, farming on that if they needed to? Is that, that was one of the issues that became that was that they were discussing earlier that I wasn't sure how, how that, that was resolved in your discussion. Yeah, that designation would would uh, be consistent with that use. Okay. There there may be other zoning issues or yeah, other good. things. Well, that, that would protect them from that aspect. Okay. So to clarify, they're they're good with option A. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Okay. The um, option D is option B to what we have right now. Correct to okay. the 2035 plan. And that's what we had talked about, leaving that, but making sure that the Land Conservancy fit in with whatever they wanted to do to make sure that they could do, you know, that was our, our, our crutch wasn't with, with the other parcels. It was more, let's make sure the Land Conservancy pieces and we talk to them that they're able to do what they want to do with those pieces in the future. And that was our big concern, wasn't as much changing the, the zoning or anything in there. It was more leave, the, leave what's in the PSA the same as it is now, but address the two parcels that were connected to the Land Conservancy to make sure that they were okay with anything that, you know, that was in there. If they wanted to change something at that time, we would. So in parcel B, is the Land Conservancy is okay with that as well? Yes, yeah, they expressed some preference for A, but they did also say that they could be okay with either. Okay. And, 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 and option B keeps it as it is now, currently. Yes. 30, 2035. As mixed use, that yep. entire quadrant being mixed use. In next to interstate, that would be a, a, um, definitely something that would work well there. Again, this, this is showing option A, the two Land Conservancy parcels designated for CCOR, and then this is the option B, where all the parcels are mixed use in that quadrant. That would give them, yeah, they're, they're okay with that as well. I, I, would, I would prefer to go with option A. That gives them, the, I think, the, the, like you said, it, it, it matches their use. It doesn't prohibit anything that they were concerned about, like farming. And it clearly says that those two pieces are not part of the, the mixed use, which they couldn't be anyway, really, because of the conservation easement. So I think it's cleaner to do it that way with option A. Well, option A changes the use on the land. 
it changes the use, but to, but to, to, a, to a use that is incompatible with, with what their long-term uh, uh, conservation uh, easements are. Yeah, but, but it would not restrict to the, owners, the other uh, part. Maybe not to the what? Oh no, maybe. not to the other part. In other words, what she's saying is that is that everything everything out there goes back. Explained the way it was. I understood you explaining it. Everything under option A, the fourteen parcels, would go back to the way they were in twenty thirty five to mixed use. Except and that, but not the two parcels that were the, the conservancy parcels, because they you know okay. They, that's what I was asking to yeah, make no, sure that all that stayed in the 2035, yeah. except for the two parcels that exactly. the land conservancy owns. And that's so option, option A. That's option, option A. A then create. I was thinking you were saying no that 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 would all change the the um, land use in the other parts. But I see what you're saying. Oh, sorry, no. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm so clear just on that. just so I'm clear, how does option A different from option B? Just just bottom line. Option A, the two land conservancy parcels are designated CCOR. Option B, the two land conservancy parcels are designated mixed use. Other than that, the options are exactly the same. They take the land use designations that are the same as the 2035 Comprehensive Plan's future land use map designations for all the other parcels in, the, in that area. So the difference then, there's still going to be mixed use, but you're putting it in CCOR with A. Is that pretty much it? Because the land conservancy pieces are kind of pulled out of that anyway. Right. Right. Yeah, as, as shown here, the two parcels in green are the land conservancy right. parcels, um, and those are the only two out of the mixed use quadrant that would be different compared to 2035. What's the benefit for someone being in a CCOR category or um, not benefit? <laughs> Uh, it, the, the land use designations are the guiding vision for the property, mm -hmm. so it's what the, the staff and PC and board would look at if there were a legislative case. Um, that's, that's one of the biggest purposes for having certain designations on the map. Does it, does it create more restrictions by having CCOR under A? To, uh, to to the others, would it create restrictions to the surrounding properties? Uh, no. No. no they okay. would still be designated mixed use. The guidance language in mixed use does talk about buffering those parcels to recognize their presence there as an important <laughs> asset. Um, but other than that, it doesn't restrict the use on those okay. mixed use properties. Yes. I, I would just say, yeah, um, I, I think that it would just remind us if we were looking at a case uh, coming forward that there are these two parcels here that are specifically um, to be conserved uh, as open space and that therefore we should sort of think about how we um, transition from one to the other. Yeah. That's our last two items on the, the um, I think we have. That's just the one, right? We have That's one just more. the one. Yeah, just one. <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> one more. I was getting there. Yeah. You want to do this one and yes. then move to the next okay. one? Yep. So we don't get confused. Do you need a motion for that? Yes. I'll take a move that we uh, accept option A. Okay. Motion on the floor. Roll call, please, sir. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. The second issue requested by the board is the moderate density residential designation. In the draft plan, this designation is revised to have two levels of potential density. The higher level of density would be based on meeting certain locational criteria um, shown in the basic description box on the slide. There are a number of, rev of revisions to this text as compared to the existing 2035 language. Um, there was a strike through version that was included in the board packet uh, that showed all of those. On the 28th, the board asked for additional discussion, potentially regarding renaming moderate density level two as high density residential. Um, staff would not recommend changing the name at this time since this may create a disconnect with the future land use map as there are not high density residential areas designated on the draft 2035 future land use map. Again, be happy to answer any questions at this time. So can this, you refresh my memory yeah, this, uh, why we've why we're rethinking this particular one. I just want to. This was the one that I raised. 
What? I raised the question. I raised the issue. That's the one on the other side of 64. Uh, no, no. This no. was this was just this was just just the designation. This did level this one. Wasn't level anything three. with any particular piece gotcha. of, of property. Okay. What I was looking at was, and I from my notes I had looked at, and I said residential designations. I think it was chart two, item two, level two. Um, because. And I, I had some notes here, and I don't see the numbers on here other than you say on on the right hand side, uh, eight units up to eight units, four to eight units per acre on on the uh, level one, and then eight to sixteen units on level two. And I guess, and I guess my question was, uh, I had notes somewhere that's up to eighteen units. I don't know where was that was that in there before or. No, that uh, mixed use uh, designation has yep. an up to 18 density, um, okay. but th this one is, uh, yeah, just 16. I, I guess what my question is, is it comes back to, uh, this is like a floating crap game. You, you can change the levels and add numbers, and we, it's all called moderate. And we got level one, level two. Next time we might have a level three and level four. And when we get to 55 units per acre, and still calling it moderate density. So I, I, for my question is, you know, everybody thinks in pretty clear terms. It's either low, medium, or high. And what is the definition of high density? And I don't think we have a, a definition of high density anywhere that I'm aware of in, in the comprehensive plan. Is, is there any, any place in the comprehensive plan that defines high density, de high density uh, as a minimum number of units per acre and above? No, there is not. The comprehensive plan just has low density residential, and previously it just had moderate density residential, just one level, yeah. and now there would be two if yeah. adopted. And, and I understand the, the reluctance to advertise something as high density because automatically everybody in the, com in the county is going to be against it because, oh, it's high density, you know. Um, and this comes back to one of the concerns I have with the comprehensive plan, uh, you know, I'm in. Uh, because of people's expectations, if you will. And I, I, think, I think that we are failing if we don't have some sort of definition. In other words, what's the top end? What is the top end? We know what the top end for low density residential shows is four units per acre. We don't know what the top end really is for moderate density because it's been a lower number in the past this now has numbers somewhere from 16 to 18 units. And personally, I don't view 16 to 18 units per acre as moderate density. That's, you know, that, that's just that's me personally. Uh, and and I, I guarantee you, if you went out and set a, sat down and had a beer with uh, some of your constituents and told them, tell me what your idea of moderate density is, they'd choke on their beer at what we're talking about. So. I'm very uncomfortable with using the device of level one, and I understand the reason. If it were, if we, if we said, all right, moderate density is going to be from, uh, you know, from four to twelve, or four to sixteen, or whatever, and you divide it those two, but somewhere you set in and say, all right, anything above this is, is we're, we're getting into a new category that we maybe don't want to talk about right now. I, I, I and I'll. I'll toss it back because, you know, I'm obviously I'm, I'm one voice out of five up here. Uh, I'm sort of curious to see how the rest of you feel about it a little bit because I'll tell you that I think one of the biggest problems we have with this comprehensive plan is there's a bit of a disconnect between what our citizens think they're telling us and what we're hearing because, you know, when they talk about, well, we want to preserve the rural lands. And we want to keep that from being built up. Well, the trade-off is that you're going to take a little higher density inside the PSA. If you ask them, that's not what they said. They said, we don't want the higher density inside the PSA, but we do want the lower density outside. Well, that's the citizen's input. You know, there's always the, the business and the other sides of the, of the factory. Every, every, everything has to be considered. But I can tell you, I don't think our citizens are really going to be very happy with the kinds of densities that we are trying to lay out here and and it's going to come back to haunt us very quickly 
sometime next year we're going to have uh, cases before us that we're going to go right to this comprehensive plan and we're going to be looking at densities that our citizens are going to say you did what you're considering what well I, I see what you're saying but on the um other side of it you know we've got the psa for putting everything in because it's got everything and i know some of the meetings i was at that people were putting dots on the larger taller buildings to keep it more condensed rather than spreading out into to the rural areas so they were like we want to protect our rural lands and we you know if we have to have a building we'd rather have a bigger building inside the psa what i was hearing and um we like to protect our rural lands outside the psa and slow down the density there um and i think this gives that ability to have that you know because eventually as we spread out we're gonna wind up nothing left in the psa and it's going to be spread then and then you know what's going to happen the psa is going to grow just like any community also now our our ability to stay within there now is, is sprawling out and as it continues to sprawl exactly what you know you're talking about we don't want is is going to end up happening when, i don't know if there's a good answer when you get to that when you get to the point like the city of williamsburg is where you're physically constrained you've developed what you can then you go vertical and you start building them more more dense yep. and i'll guarantee you i don't think i can find anybody in this town who likes what's going up on monticello avenue uh, and and you know and ultimately if you're talking about putting higher density inside the PSA that's what you're going to be looking at and and that I, I, I guarantee you that uh, you're gonna have 80 85 percent of the people in this count in this county say that's not what our vision is for this county but Alan if you it could you explain so I'm looking at the difference between level one and level two where the optimally located areas would be and you're looking at a difference between intersections of collector or arterial streets versus high capacity roadways and near intersections of collector or arterial streets. So that tells me that the level two is going to be in a more densely populated area anyway set up for that. Yes. Um, thank you for that question. It, just to to. Uh, answer that there are a set of moderate density residential designated parcels on the future land use map in various locations in the county. Um, some of those, we haven't done a full analysis as staff yet to see which ones would more likely fall in level one or level two, but some of them would be more level one and some more level two. In those instances, if they're level one, the up to eight is actually less density than what the moderate density residential designation had had as the maximum previously. Whereas now, for certain locations that are more suited to take higher density uh, projects, um, there is a four unit per acre increase as compared to what it was before. But there's some nuance in how how the designation works as compared to perhaps a one size fits all. So offer. since our county is so diverse in what it looks like, is it possible we can have both levels in there and just decide as a project comes forward which it is better suited for? Yes, I think the, the current thought, and there's uh, things that we will need to work through as we update our zoning ordinances following the process, and um, there may be more de details to come on that. but. As it's set up, um, it would be looking at the project that was proposed and having an evaluation Plugging it in. against the, the criteria that are in the designation description. Ellen, would, would level two fall underneath, um, say, Newtown? Um, Being that an acre, and we've got the buildings that are vertical. And you, have, you have certain places on the map that are designated for level two, aren't they, haven't you? They're not pre-designated. It's, it's to do with uh, the location. And like I okay, said, so, we, so, so basically you have, you, you have the, I thought there were certain areas that you had, maybe it was mixed use. Yes. Mixed use, you have some that are designated 
one level and, and others another level. Correct. Yep. Okay. Would New, uh, Newtown fall under that, say, even 16 per acre? Uh, Newtown uh, is designated mixed use, so it in that designation you can go up to 18 dwelling units per acre. If there were some property in that general vicinity that were designated MDR, it's a little bit hypothetical to answer, um, but I would think looking at the locational criteria, likely that be that would be a level two area um, if let a project me, came Let forward. me ask one other question, uh, and maybe you have the answer to this, I don't know. Um, because I just recently have been through Newtown quite a bit, um, and I know there are some areas in Newtown that are, you know, they're, they're, it's a little more densely populated uh -huh. and stuff. But then there are some of the places like the uh, uh, apartments over there, the, the condos or whatever, right by uh, uh, Watson Lane, uh, that there have got to be some of those that are above 18 units in, in certain small land bays or areas that, that, that you're looking at the 18 in, on a on a larger basis where you have some open space to set, offset it or whatever. How, how do you? How, how would you? How would you get? How would you uh, categorize this? Are there some of those communities where if you just drew the lines right in around only the buildings, we would be well above 18 units per per acre? Um, that is a hard question to answer. Is you're right for a, a large development like uh, Newtown. Um, there's a, a bunch of different sections. Oh, yeah. I don't, off the top of my head, know what the density is of, I know the apartments you're referring to, yeah. but unfortunately I don't know what the density would be if you just drew the line exactly around those apartments. I remember when we did the one on the other side, Founders Village, the initial proposal there was much, much more dense, and we asked them to, to back it off a little bit. But what they were trying to do is they were trying to swipe every available unit left over from Utown and Right. Stuff it all into one it. small piece of property, uh -huh. and and that's that's a consideration. That, that's a uh, take a look at the old CCRC out on on News Road when when that was approved. Uh, that was approved at a very. If you look at that piece of property by itself, the density was off the, was off the chart. The way they did it was they said we'll make it all part of R four with Ford's Colony, wash it against all the open space and wetlands and stuff, and now we just have you know a one and a half or two units an acre. Uh, average over the whole thing but the intense development proposed on one small piece of property is something I think that we've got to be very very careful about and we're setting ourselves up for a real problem is what I see by going with what? But, but if we don't have a definition a clear definition of, of, of where we where we cross from from moderate the density to high density. But let's 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 be let's be honest. Let's call it what it is. If you're going to have high density, call it high density. But we don't. We're basically trying to make everybody feel good by not calling it what it really is. And I, and I, that I have a problem with, and I think a lot of our citizens have a problem with. But uh, obviously, I'm a, a minority on the on the on the, on the board, so I, I I just wanted to, to, to voice my concerns about it. Uh, you know, that's, that's a. Uh... So I think I'm confused on what you're saying because it looks to me like they're laying out exactly what it is. What's high density? What's high density? It's not written. Well, she's just looking at moderate, though. I thought we were just talking about moderate. My question is, all right, I changed the number from 18 to 28 and still call it moderate. Can you do that? Sure. We didn't have a level one or level two before, did we? I don't know. I'm asking. It sounds like we need to have a further discussion on d tackling density or tack. I mean, I'm not. We can move forward, right. but but come back to a density issue of yes. what would be low, medium, and high. Yes. If we want to do that that way, or one, two, three level of yeah density. I mean, because I don't think we're gonna no. right. We're is that a? I think there are too many questions. A discussion worth. But what does that do to our what we have in place now? Because that's going to change. Yeah. It, so if if you if the board wanted to change moderate density level to to high density, that in itself would be pretty straightforward within the plan. It's just 
the, the land use map would yeah. not have any areas on it designated high density residential. Mm -hmm. So it'd be a designation with no immediate practical application to so it. So could we pass what we have and come back with an amendment of this to go to add well, to unless it? unless you change the, the designation, the map designation, that, that I'm, I'm almost thinking that, you know, I'm not against this at all, of changing that, but I'm thinking that might be in our next comp plan review that this might be with the land map used, and all that may have to all be looked in from the Planning Commission and then brought back to us as a recommendation because we're going to have to change two things, not just, we can't just change one thing. So that that would be, I think, our next comp plan, and we'll just have to deal with what we have, but our next comp plan, and then the Planning Commission vet it through them and then bring it to us, and that would be one of our things for the next comp plan that we need to look at is Jim's concern on what is high density and, and how does that affect the, the map and everything else. And, and just to note that in that process, uh, if there were properties that were appropriate for designating that, that would allow for the land use app application process to occur so that there were properties designated in, in uh, each of the buckets that where there were uh, descriptions in the comp plan. We could roll it all up in one and, and have, definitely have a, on the next comp plan a good add them all in and, and have, a, have a better understanding. If the board directed that. Yes. Yeah. I know that doesn't answer Jim tonight, but That's no, does I mean, that get it moving you know, it, forward? I, I, I guess what, what I'm saying is, is that, that it's, it's, a, it's a moving target because yes. we've decided we're going to have low density residential. That's always been pretty clear. It's one to four units. What's not been clear is anything above four units has been moderate. But we've always been very flexible about how far that goes. And, and the question is, we, we haven't really defined the parameters, if you will, because the parameters for, and, and I, Paul, I see Paul moving up here. He can probably correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure he will. <laughs> the parameters, I've, the, my understanding of, of previous comp plans uh, for moderate density, that range has actually gotten a little larger than it what used to be. Uh, and so then the question is, is it, if, if it was, if it was, 12 before and 16 now, is it still moderate? And if 16 is there, will it be 24? Is that still moderate? So, you know, I, yeah, somewhere along the line, we need to have a, a, a clear understanding because we everybody's got a clear understanding of what, what low density residential is. When we start getting to moderate and we start talking about moderate and mixed use uh, and, 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 uh, and the blowback I see to things that are going on around us, uh, like that, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about it. So uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and let so, you guys. Press so on. we do have we do have development that's over um, uh, 16 units per acre, right? Uh, Multi-family um, kind of. We we have that uh, in the designation description for oh, mixed I'm, use. I'm about, we we ha actually literally have that now. Oh no. In the community. Um, I believe so, but I'm not. I couldn't say with certainty. We must have that we in must. terms of apartment buildings and and townhouse communities. Perhaps. Uh, and what do we call them? We call them uh, multifamily. Is that and that's a different designation? Or I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so we do have places in the community that are going to be more than 16 or 18 units per acre. Yeah. We Residential have, units like apartments or townhouses. Um, the, the difficulty in answering that question is just that many of those are part of larger master plan communities. And as we were kind of discussing earlier, sometimes it isn't broken down where we've calculated a, a density. Right, but there are a lot that are not part of master plan communities like uh, a um, uh, Long Hill uh, the, the Regency at L Long Hill or um, uh, Conway Square. Gardens, right? Uh, any any of those kinds of uh, uh, apartment complexes where you've got you know four units to a building or, or six units to a building or eight, uh, and uh, uh, obviously you're exceeding uh, even the 16 to 18 units per acre 
uh, unless yeah. they're non-conforming, if they're zoned R5, the maximum density would be 12 for some of those complexes that you're just mentioning. So we have a maximum capacity for multifamily. Um, I'm speaking to the, the zoning district, the R5 right. zoning district. Yes, uh -huh. So, so I, I'm guessing that if, I mean, if, if we have a, a, a zoning district that, that places a restriction on, on the density, why wouldn't we have that more, more generally understood? Seems to me that, that we want to know what, what we expect to be the maximum amount of, of density that's going to be permitted. Well, it, it, goes, it goes back to one of the previous arguments we've had, John. It, it, we're like, remember where we talked about developable versus not developable? Sure. You know, if it's uh, so many units, I got, I got uh, 100 acres and I can put uh, four units per acre. There's 400 units, but I've got 50% 50, 50 of it is swampland. So I put all of it on the remaining and I, now instead of uh, four units, I got eight units per acre on the developable land, but I get to wash it against the swampland. Uh, and you know we went through this argument about a floating scale of, of how you uh, provide how you account for parcels that have a high pro, uh, pro, uh, port proportion of the property which is non developable, and and so you know it, it's density is a is is a very um, slippery subject when you start talking about it because you, you can you can uh, depend it, it all depends on how you define things you know and ultimately the question becomes. On a good piece of property that you can build something on, how many of them you got to cram into a small piece of property? Now you can wash it against wetlands, you can wash it against uh, open space, you know, golf course, whatever, and say, "Oh, the overall density is such and such." Yeah, but the point density right here is really, really high, and I think that's one of the concerns that uh, that I, you know, I've seen this before. With other developments, as we over the years, where we've taken a look at them and, and we've had these arguments, uh, we haven't had many cases like this come before us. I think we're going to have a bunch of them next year. We're going to be into, up to our eyebrows in land use cases, and we're going to be starting talking about things like this, about densities and what the impact is on our community. Uh, because I guarantee you that if a developer can put 200 in as opposed to 100, that's what he's going to try for. You know, and they're going to try for whatever they can get. We have to be prepared to make a, a, a really defensible argument of what is in the best interest of our citizens. And I think we've got a comp plan that's not going to be very helpful to us in that argument. And I think we're going to have to wrestle with that uh, in, in the next year or so. Uh, be remiss if I didn't uh, pass along the, the wisdom from Mr. Holt that he was going to share, share with you. Um, just to mention that there are a couple protections um, if this were issue to, were to wait. Um, the current zoning ordinances that would implement the comprehensive plan are, uh, you know, are what they are based on past comprehensive plans. So um, as I was mentioning, our R5 district, which is one of the most typical districts to implement the, the moderate density residential designation currently has a limit of 12 and it would need to be amended um, before anything over that could be achieved. So the board would have the opportunity to review any amendments to that zoning district and the other districts as well. Um, and in addition to that, um, as, as uh, discussed within the, the text here, any legislative case that comes before you, it's uh, definitely not an automatic that you go to the highest uh, level. It talks about anything um, at the higher end needing to offer public benefits and it lists some there. And that's an opportunity for the board to review the proposal, consider the impacts, consider the benefits that are offered in, in um, deciding how they would like to vote on that case. Where are we? <laughs> <Got me. Excused. laughs> we circled a wagon three times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Still looking at no, the back I, of the horse. You know, it, it, it can be, it can stay the way it is because obviously, that, you know, it, it, I think everybody, it's not uh, 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 that high of a priority for the board to wrestle with that at this stage of the game. Where we'll have to wrestle with it is when we come back to deal with the ordinances and then we're going to have to wrestle with it when we come start dealing with um, land use cases. But I, 
felt I would be remiss if I didn't express my concern uh, about that potential problem, which I've seen come back and deal, you know, bite us year, time and time again. I, John's been around as long as I have, and he's, he's seen the same thing. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating at times because there's so we always can, press. We can leave it the way that it is, yeah. but we can come back to the question about the density. About the density. Okay. Yeah. I forgot. Uh, All right. See, so I guess I need a motion. motion the mo did you leave it? Just, just leave, leave it, it like is. it is. We have to have a motion, or nope, can nope. we just? No, I don't need think we need. I think motion. I think it's probably yeah. better not nope. to have a motion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was the motion. <laughs> nope. No. No. Okay. No. no. We'll leave it as is, and. But do we oh. need a motion for the comp plan? Um, yes. So, so let me just raise one question about that, one point about that, and and it is simply that um, you know we've had uh, a fair amount of discussion since the public hearing that occurred on this document, and uh, um, here we are in a in a work session um, adopting this comprehensive plan for a five year period. I don't think that there's really a lot of debate left over it. Um, there are things that I think. Any of us could point to and say we really need to start thinking about that now for the next time around. Uh, but uh, just as a procedural matter, I, I wonder if it doesn't make sense to do this at a regular board meeting. You just make, do the official approval. Um, it gives the citizens one last chance during um, uh, public comment to, to say anything they want to say. And Quite then honestly, I think we've hashed it out enough. I'm ready to move on. <laughs> Well, okay. That's just that's the way I am. We've heard from citizens for months now, so I'm that's fine. Say the rest of you. I'm fine to move move ahead, and that way staff can start working on it and get things moving. I think staff was under the thought that we were going to be yes. moving ahead today because oh, we'd already pushed it. So I'm okay with moving ahead. But I hear you, John. But uh -huh. but right. yeah. A motion. Motion. All right. We have a motion on the floor for approval. Roll call, sir. Ms. Larson. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Board requests and directives. Page. So we're running longer, but that's okay. We got plenty of time. <laughs> Do we know what happened with our lighting in here? I, yes, ma'am. We're told on, was over here with the flashlight. Well, we are working online in terms of online. You look pretty good. I'm told that the it was not worth resetting the facility, the system. Our, our technicians thought we could reset it, and it may work, but that it may not. And so rather than have that break, we've continued on, and I apologize for that. We'll have it resolved by your next meeting. But I'm not so worried about the way I look. It's the way I, I can I, see. I, I think, I'm with you. I think one possibility might be to have a small reading lamp here. Yeah, just in case, best. because it, it, it is a strain. Yeah. So. Yeah. One that's adjustable. Yeah. <laughs> I will pass on mine. Or All right. You're passing? Um, I uh, attended the uh, HRTPO and the HRPDC meeting, uh, and uh, that was the day after I spent an hour and 45 minutes at a dead stop on the Willoughby Spit Bridge. Isn't that great? Oh, it's a fun God. time. I enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> um, I did want to highlight for our citizens and for the other fellow board members one of the things that caught me flat-footed for that meeting at the HRTPO, and that was that uh, congestion pricing, i.e. tolls, on HOV lanes is coming to the peninsula, mm -hmm. which I was not mm -hmm. aware of. Great. And I had a conversation with uh, Chairman Hipple about it. Uh, apparently... Uh, the state level people have done some done their homework and done some back channel work and 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 gotten that so uh, i i think that's going to uh create some problems for our citizens um i don't know how they intend to implement it i don't know who intend who gets the money it, but it, uh, it's going to be a um hr tax supposed to get um, the biggest fund but um vdot for the gantries and all that they're going to get x amount for that and it's going to start right there at jefferson where the hov lane starts and they're going to take over that hov lane since they say <clears throat> they're already holding that lane for 
high traffic occupancy of two or more and certain hours you can't ride through there unless you've got two people in there other hours you can ride single but they've decided they're going to go ahead and take that lane and make that part of the gantry and part of the connection of the circle that goes around and and we were holding them at la salle and they crept down into newport news so uh, and, and, you and, still got the free yeah. lanes mm -hmm. but if it starts getting congested and you've got to be somewhere and you decide i want to pay x amount you could drop over in that left hand lane hit the gantry and keep on going and it'll just pick up your and, and smart my, my concern is when they, they extend that to the third lane all the way to richmond so that <laughs> yeah yeah mm -hmm. so anyway uh, I thought yeah, you all needed to be made aware of that. Uh, the HRBT project, uh, I guess they told us the boring machine arrives next month, November. Um, the boring starts at the August 22nd, August of 22 and ends in August of 24. Um, and at completion by September 25. Their legislative agenda from the HRTPO, uh, number one of the highest ones there was the uh, I-64 gap, 29 miles. Uh, they're estimating 600 to 700 million for that. Um, they're still looking for Elizabeth River tolls relief, but I think that's a pipe dream given the way they gave away the store on that. Um, they are there are some uh, requests for improved passenger rail service and alternatives to fuel tax. The PDC one of the things that came up was that uh, there's a going to be a sale 250. I don't know whether anybody's aware of this, but they they called that the semi quincentennial. 250th anniversary of, of our independence. Uh, and it's going to coincide with the, uh, shortly after the HRBT opening and the offshore wind project completion. Um, and there was a, a big presentation on that. Uh, they had a lot of things on legislative agenda as well, um, which I found very interesting. State support for schools construction was one of them. Yep. Um, local ability, John, local ability to preserve and expand the tree canopy. Uh -huh. um, and uh, talking about... Uh, Relief from some of our public notice requirements, publication in, in newspapers. So there were some very interesting things in their in their uh, legislative agenda. There were a whole whole laundry list of things, but I just wanted to highlight a, a few of those. Uh, and that's all I had. Thank you. I think Sue, did you have something? Yeah. Here? Sorry, I'm back in time. You you want um, to, okay? I just wanted to say I attended virtually the um, the regional jail board meeting along with Mr. Stevens, uh, the AFD committee meeting, and. EDA meeting. Um, from the EDA meeting, they um, made an announcement that the Southern Economic Development Corporation, who presented us with our second award for participation in the Virginia 30-Day Fund, will be bringing their annual conference back to the Historic Triangle in 2023. And also, Terry Benez from the Chamber gave a presentation um, to the EDA on the upcoming Keep It Here Shop Local Boost Program. The three localities are partnering um, by donating along with the Chamber and Chesapeake Bank. And how it works is a citizen can pay $25 towards a $50 gift card or certificate that can be used anywhere locally, small businesses and restaurants. And it will be advertised on Tide Radio, uh, WMBG, WY Daily, and other areas. And the plan is to have a tent set up at least now once, maybe twice, um, for folks to pick up cards. And they're looking right now at Merchant Square in Williamsburg, Riverwalk in Yorktown, and Newtown, and or Prime Outlets in James City County. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. I yes, just would mention that um, it's been a couple weeks almost now, but I attended the main uh, grand, <coughs> grand opening ribbon cutting. Uh, Supervisor McLennan and Terry McLennan at did as well. It is the new uh, event space that is here in James City County. It's at 2580 John Tyler Highway. It's gorgeous and it's already, they've got over 50 weddings on the books. Wow. Um, much needed here. So really excited for that. Um, have a uh, tourism meeting coming up um, the Tuesday after VACO and have VACO I, coming up. I did go down to the uh, Peninsula Chamber of Commerce uh, for they did a, a women in leadership breakfast and um, oh, oh gosh, I cannot believe it's totally slipping my mind now. It was a, it's a woman from James City County was one of the presenters. 
and we know her. She does she does work with our economic development. I am so I'm so embarrassed. I will follow up with that at the next meeting because I cannot believe I forgot. Um, Am I Kate? No, 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 no. It's a business owner. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, of a um, advertising marketing. Okay. Pardon? Effie Howell. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're the hero today. <laughs> um, and so, anyway, she did a great job representing James City County um, well. So um, that was good. And that's what's going on. I'll try to do this real quick. Um, first of all, I just wanted to uh, uh, congratulate uh, Supervisor Larson. Uh, she gave excellent comments at the main for the dedication. And she held a very successful fundraiser to, to assist uh, one of our uh, community members who has suffered some serious health setbacks. Uh, just a tremendous uh, crowd showed up to, to lend their support uh, and uh, wonderful chili and hot dogs and, <laughs> and all sorts of great food. Thank you, Minister Stevens, for coming. Uh, and uh, I attended uh, the opening of uh, the Community Action Agency, which is now operating under the, under the uh, initials of ACE, which I can't remember exactly. But, uh, <laughs> I feel ya. Community Excellence uh, uh, for their new um, uh, preschool and uh, prep academy uh, uh, out at Poplar Hall um, uh, Office Park. Uh, fantastic facility, uh, great energy, uh, and I think they're really uh, doing some wonderful things out there. Uh, and uh, just one other thing to mention is uh, Senator Mason uh, with the um, uh, hosting of uh, our social services department under, under Ms. Vinroot uh, held a fantastic session on uh, addressing the needs of young people aging out of the foster care system and uh, especially in how to uh, connect them uh, to the workplace uh, in, and uh, it was just a, a very, very inspiring uh, session and one that uh, is, has, has motivated a lot of people to continue working on this uh, issue uh, going forward. Uh, I, I slightly lied, There's, there was uh, uh, one other um, uh, opening that I was going to mention, um, but I'll forget. Uh, uh, what that's going to be. I'll just, uh, oh no, I know what it is. is. I know what it is. Uh, the Career Works has opened at Thomas, at uh, Virginia Peninsula Community College uh, uh, Historic Triangle Campus, uh, so that now uh, people don't have to travel uh, down to Hampton uh, for, for those services. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, offices open uh, throughout the week uh, uh, the uh, community college, the county, the city. York County are all helping to staff that uh, facility, uh, but it's a great opportunity for people who are looking for work or looking for training opportunities for employers to find out about the opportunity to partner with uh, the uh, Hampton Roads Workforce Council uh, on programs that uh, if they take on new workers uh, uh, for the training period, they get half of the salary supplemented uh, by a grant from the uh, Workforce Council. Tremendous opportunities for uh, uh, dynamic companies that yeah. may be engaged in construction, for instance, yeah. or <laughs> other, other matters. So, Yes, ma'am. I just I did want to follow up about the two retirees that we had here this evening. That was just really incredible to me, and I'm sure there's so many others out there, or whether you've worked, you know, one year, six months. I mean, just so appreciative of every all the efforts that are given to the county. But I just sat there and thought, boy, 49 years, like they're – is always something that you're like, what did we do, and what did, where did we put that, or what? And there it goes, yep. because that person we w won't get that institutional knowledge, and there's no way she was able to tell every, and probably half the people are like, hey, we're not going to need to know that. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you are. Yeah. And that gentleman for 31 years and working two jobs, I mean, that's just really, I really appreciate that you're doing those retirement recognitions yep. in here. And that we get to uh, say a, just a small thank you to um, to the people that that work here. Oh, so. well, Miss Larson, I appreciate the board allowing that. I think the employees that are willing to come, because some don't want to be front and center, really appreciate yeah. that recognition as well. So thank you. It's just tremendous.
All right, I have a lot to go over, but I forgot it all. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> uh, uh, no. You will I had one to day. keep it going. I had to keep the rhythm going down. down. Um, uh, County Administrator and I went to Mayors and Chairs yesterday, and um, our big discussion was, um, of course, we talked about everything that's going on in the communities and all that, as, as all y'all know, being um, chairs at one time or another. And um, but one of our big discussions I wanted to talk about was was crime and how it's affecting every community and the stress level that we're all under and the 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 flashpoint that's right on the surface seems to be on everybody just from all the pressure everybody's been under this last year and a half and and how other communities are dealing with it and what we need to do regionally you know we see and and Mayor Tuck laughed because I said well it's coming from you know, you know, we're getting people from out of our area. And he said, really? I said, no, Mayor, I'm not saying, <laughs> you know, but um, <laughs> Mayor Tuck's a good guy. We have a great time to go. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, you know, the, the influences that are just everybody's got that just ready to snap at any moment. And how do we work together as a community? How do we educate our community? What do we do to reach the younger people? And, um, and after reading an article in the WI Daily about, you know, what we're losing as far as officers in schools and other areas, I want to kind of bring ours in and promote what we're doing and have the chief come in and, and tell us that, you know, our officers are not going to school to arrest somebody. They're going to school to make their life better and try to get them used to I know my, all my kids knew all the officers, not because they got in trouble, they found them and looked at them and, and searched them out, and, and um, they always enjoyed it, and we've got officers in our family. So, you know, it, it wasn't, a, you know, strange to go up to a police officer and, and talk to them, and I want to try to encourage that for our whole community to take time and meet the officers, meet the firefighters, meet the EMS providers. Stop and talk to them. You know, I know you might have been raised to be careful. Don't do this. Don't do that. And I understand that. I understand your concerns and your thoughts and all. But please, if you get a chance, take a minute and tell an officer, how you doing? What's up? Thanks for doing your job. And it means a lot. And um, they're under pressure just like all of us. And the only difference is there's a chance they can get shot. Most of us won't, won't have that issue, thank God, in our life. And Thank God they're there to protect us. So hats off to the officers. Next, we'll move into our county administrator's report. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I would like to share the Williamsburg Health Foundation awarded their 2021 annual award to the emergency management departments of James City County, York County, and the city of Williamsburg to honor their efforts uh, uh, and innovations during the pandemic. And our community benefited greatly from their collaborative leadership and steadfast commitment to public health. This award was accompanied by a $5,000 grant to each uh, locality to further our department's collaborative work and with community-based organizations. And I do want to thank the Williamsburg Health Foundation for this award and really to commend our staff, emergency management staff, on their efforts to ensure our communities was well served throughout the pandemic. So I just want to say congratulations to our staff and again, thank you to the Williamsburg Health Foundation for recognizing their efforts. So that's all I have. Yeah, thank you. All right, next we have a closed session and we'll go in consideration of personnel matter, the appointment of individuals to county boards and or commissions pursuant to section 2.3 or 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia and also discuss or consider of the investment of public funds where competition or bargaining is involved where if made public Initially, the financial interest of the government unit would be adversely affected by and consulting with legal counsel employed or retired by the public body regarding specified legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be considered to be permitted for closed session of the meeting merely because an attorney represents the public body and is in attendance or is in consult of this matter pursuant of section 2.2-3711 a6 and a8 of the virginia code and mr chairman just to further qualify that that's for discussion of the um county city school contract so move so move roll call please sir sadler hi Hour. 
Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Ripp? Aye. Mr. Williams?
Mr. Chairman, I move to certify that we only spoke about those items we indicated we would speak about going into closed session. Thank you, sir. Roll call, please. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. And, Mr. Chairman, I would move that we appoint uh, to the Colonial Community uh, Criminal Justice Board uh, Judge, uh, uh, Def Judge Josh DeFord for a term that will uh, extend to July 31st, 2023. Okay. We'll vote on that one or put them. Mm -hmm. well, I guess we'll vote on that one. And can we have a motion? Roll call. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, I move the following uh, candidates for appointment to the Natural and Cultural Assets uh, Mapping Committee uh, for a term that uh, I don't see a date for. Um, I think it's the expiration of the committee's time until the report comes back to okay, you. Until the, until the report comes back. And uh, nominate Adrian Frank, uh, Mary Bressler, uh, Jay Everson, uh, Jennifer uh, Greitensberger, uh, Matthew Woolsey, Deborah Bussert, and and uh, Bruce Abbott and Alan Outlaw. Motion on the floor. Roll call, please. Sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next, we have adjournment till 5 p.m. on November 9th, 2021, at a regular meeting. I have a motion. So moved. moved. So moved. Roll call, please, sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Motion carries. Aye.